two, one. Thank you. We will uh, begin the planning committee meeting of Akron City Council. Uh, at this point, I'd like to entertain a motion that we accept the minutes of the previously held meeting. So moved. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Very good. The ayes have it. Um, we have a, a, an item that is up for a public hearing today. Um, the procedures are, we will swear everyone in. Um, we have a public hearing at one right now. And then at seven o'clock, we will have an additional public hearing. The procedures in essence will be the same. Um, however, the only major difference is going to be that at the seven o'clock after that public hearing, the committee will make a recommendation to all of city council of which either will be in favor, against, or to table the item and take time. Those are the procedures. Uh, the public hearing though, what will happen is, is that we will, um, I'm going to ask a representative from our law department to swear in everyone who is uh, present and would like to testify before the, uh, the committee today. We'll repeat that procedure again this evening at seven o'clock. Um, I'm gonna ask, due to the large number of speakers, um, I'm going to ask that remarks uh, be concise uh, and not be redundant, respectfully re request that. Um, we wanna give everyone an opportunity to address city council with their concerns. We wanna hear from you. Um, we want everyone to be respectful of everyone else and everyone else's time. Uh, we will uh, ask that your comments are three minutes or less. So that's the procedures. At this point, I'm going to ask Mr. John York from our oh. law department to swear in those individuals that would like to testify before the committee this afternoon. Mr. York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is gonna take a second because I have to make sure everybody's got their um, cameras on and their microphones unmuted. So if you plan on testifying today, folks, if you could please unmute your microphones. <laughs> it appears that all the witnesses have their microphones unmuted. So folks, if you could please raise your right hand if you plan on testifying today. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. York. Uh, at this time, I'm going to request that uh, Mr. Mike Antonucci from our planning department provide a, uh, a description and a report uh, from the planning department in reference to the uh, conditional use request that we have before us, which is, um, I'll read that in. Um, Ordinance authorizing a conditional use to construct a new housing development at 1870 Akron Peninsula Road and declaring an emergency. Uh, Mr. Antonucci. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Uh, Petros Development Group is requesting permission to construct this new housing development at this location. <laughs> Residential uses are not permitted in this UPD 22 district. Uh, Petros Development Group is proposing to construct 197 residential townhome units with attached garages. Uh, 169 of these units will be for rent apartments and 28 of the units will be for sale homes. The development will include a mix of four unit types, including one story ranch townhomes and two story townhomes. The total project site area is approximately 76 acres. The development will include approximately 54 acres of open space, which is 71% of the project site. The open space includes approximately nine acres of private open space to be utilized by residents of the new development and 45 acres of public open space uh, fronting on the Cuyahoga River. A permanent access easement will ensure that the public open space will remain accessible to the general public. The petitioner states that all of the proposed residential construction will occur outside of the FEMA 100 year floodplain. All stormwater management for the new development will be on site. The petitioner proposes to return 45 acres of riverfront property 
to a condition with native vegetation. This will allow the land along the river to serve as a more effective floodplain than the existing manicured golf course. Uh, all utilities for the, de the development will be accessed from Akron Peninsula Road. And the petitioner will construct a new sanitary pump station on site to service the development. <clears throat> new water service will be connected in a loop to the water main for redundancy. Preliminary traffic impact analysis by prime AE group engineers includes that the development would not substantially affect traffic operations in the area. The preliminary analysis does not include a need for a traffic signal with the new entrance to the development. However, a full traffic study will be necessary to determine final required traffic uh, control measures. Uh, the project has been thoroughly reviewed by public service and Office of Integrated Development and Public Service Divisions, including traffic engineering, environmental engineering, development engineering, long range planning and zoning. Uh, the petitioner has made substantial adjustments to the proposed site plan per city recommendations, resulting in an improved site layout and overall design. Proposed apartment townhouses meet all of the development requirements for apartment homes. The proposed residential use is more compatible with the character of the surrounding area than the commercial use is allowed under the current UPD 22 zoning. The construction of these new housing units will further the goal of increasing the city's population in accordance with the uh, Planning to Grow Akron Housing Strategy, Office of Integrated Development, Planning Staff and Planning Commission recommend approval subject to conditions. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Antonucci, for the report. Um, we're going to open up the public hearing at this time, and I will ask uh, any of those that are that wish to speak in favor of this conditional use. Now, what we're going to do is I will uh, uh, say your name and then that's whenever that will be your cue to unmute yourself and then to provide your testimony. Uh, what we do here uh, at, uh, at the planning committee, we ask for all those who are in favor to go first and then those who are against to go last. So at this point, I'm going to ask, and if I pronounce your name wrong, I apologize. It's uh, certainly not intentional, believe me. People have pronounced my name wrong for years. But uh, first of all, we'll ask for, uh, uh, in favor, Greg Modick uh, for the petitioner. Are you present, Mr. Modick? Uh, yes, I am present. Uh, am I able to screen share to put uh, something up during my presentation? Yes. Yes. If I, if I can technically do it, I'll give that a shot here real quick. Did that pull up okay for everyone's end over there? Yes. See it. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, video is uh, name and address, correct? Uh, Greg Modick, 10474 Broadview Road, Broadview Heights, Ohio. I uh, just want to start by saying, you know, quick background on myself. I am a uh, licensed civil engineer and uh, res proud uh, graduate of the University of Akron for both my civil engineering and surveying degree there. Um, there's four topics that uh, I would like to touch on. Uh, planning and zoning component, um, which I will speak to. Uh, conservation and public use, which uh, Mr. Derek Schaefer with Webb's Creek Conservancy will speak directly to. Um, environmental impacts, which would be through Greg Snowden with uh, Davy Resource and economic growth, who Sam Petros with Petros Development would speak to. Um, you know, my biggest takeaway, I, I diligently listened throughout the planning commission meeting that we had. Uh, I know there was a lot of people speaking. I tried to take quite a few notes throughout. In fact, uh, over the weekend, too, revisited and listened to the entire uh, presentation on all ends with it. Probably one of the biggest takeaways I had from the residents who spoke were, you know, the message was delivered numerous times throughout that they're not anti-development, they're anti-unplanned development. And I wanted to take this time here during my presentation to assure you that this was not an unplanned development. Um, Mr. Antonucci touched on it in that there's been uh, a quite a bit of time put into this, six, seven months potentially with hundreds of person hours put into it uh, on, on their end and probably double or triple that on our end trying to work with them on it. Um, you know, when we first pulled our market study on this, it warranted and looked at the potential for six to 800 typical apartment units, three, four story walk-ups. In talking with Akron and evaluating the site, uh, it became very clear that was not the appropriate use for this site. Uh, we dove into you know, Akron's long-term growth plans, 
uh, and their partnership with AARP to grow senior housing that kind of led us down this path of the ranch for sale, or I'm sorry, for lease units and the 28 for sale products within there. Um, I wanted to just state that when this project started, it had 48 acres of land associated with it. Uh, through our collaboration with Akron and the involvement of West Creek Conservancy, we were able to grow it to uh, 75 acres to have the entire Cuyahoga River preserved. Uh, there was then the requirement for potential for parking along Akron Peninsula and a bridge across the Cuyahoga. We acquired and went out and added to it uh, additional three acres that allows for the parking up along Akron Peninsula Road uh, for, for future cons conservation uses. And then a piece on the other side of the Cuyahoga River for the possibility of a pedestrian bridge to um, cross this. Uh, what that process over the last six, seven months has yielded is the, the project you see in front of you here today uh, that we'll touch on and discuss. Um, you know, what that's also yielded is a recommendation of approval from the Office of Integrated Development and Planning as well as the Planning Commission. I'd be glad to answer any questions that the, the Council Committee here may have. Uh, thank you very much for your time and consideration on this. I'm gonna leave my screen share up for, for Derek, uh, Mr. Snowden, and Mr. Petros, and then I can take it down if that's okay with the Commission. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Modic. Uh, at this time, we'll uh, like to hear from uh, Mr. Sam Petros. I think Derek Schaefer, if that's appropriate, was next, and then Greg Snowden, Mr. Fusco. Okay, that's not on my list. I apologize. <laughs> so uh, that's fine. Uh, who, who is it you're requesting? Derek Schaefer with West Creek Conservancy. Okay, very good. Okay, Derek Schaefer, you're up. All right, my name is Derek Schaefer with West Creek Conservancy, uh, 7381 Camelot Drive in Parma. And uh, I'm here as a piece of conservation to a, a, to a larger initiative. And, uh, you know, we've worked diligently to protect areas throughout greater Cleveland and Northeast Ohio, including sections of Mudbrook and Woodward Creek. And those were done in partnership with uh, not only the city of Akron, but also some private entities as well. And, you know, our opportunity here is to work with the developer to protect a significant reach along the Cuyahoga. You know, I, I'm not the builder nor the developer, but, you know, we are... Um, looking at an opportunity to create some publicly accessible land along the Cuyahoga River, a little over a mile, and look long-term at its restoration, not only in terms of recreation, but ecological functionality, and you know, create an asset for not only the folks that are there, because in reality, if this, if this property were to remain private, the, the public would not have you know, recreational or otherwise access to the property and to the river. And we're an entity that helped create the, or you know, helped along with 26 other partners uh, to designate the Cuyahoga River a, wa a state water trail. And looking at the acreage within this development, um, you know, the first step is to get land control in order to provide those recreational amenities, such as a put in or take out along the Cuyahoga. And we, we never do anything by ourselves. You know, it's always done in prideful partnerships. And, you know, restoration and recreational improvements do take time and resources and also clear a little airs. Uh, I, I saw a figure out there that was put out by somebody that we only spent $198,000 or some, um, some dollar in 2018 towards uh, improvements. But just, just so everyone knows that that dollar figure fluctuates quite a bit. In 2019, it was well over 2 million and in 2020, it's gonna be well over. And that does not account for the dollars that we help leverage through our partners to put those recreational amenities on properties like this. So uh, we're here again as a piece of a larger puzzle to preserve a significant reach and stretch of the Cuyahoga and to act as a landholder and work with our partners in the future, whether that is the city of Akron or even Metro Parks, I don't know, um, you know or uh, local residents on what kind of recreational improvements we'd all like to see on the site as well as the future connectivity across the river to the towpath. And I do apologize. I have a prior commitment tonight at seven, but um, you know, I'm readily reachable if anyone needs to uh, learn anything more about us or our intent on the project. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Thank you. Uh, who's uh, next? Mr. Modic? Do you have someone else? Yeah, yes, it'd be uh, Greg Snowden and then Sam Petros, and that would be it. So Greg Snowden's next. Okay, Mr. Snowden. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Greg Snowden. I'm a senior biologist with Davey Resource Group. Our uh, office address is 905 Bryce Road in Kent, Ohio, 44240. A uh, little bit about me. I have a master's degree in ecology from the University of Notre Dame, a uh, professional wetland scientist, certified ecological restoration practitioner, and a proud um, born and raised Merriman Valley resident, uh, lived there for 18 years and graduated from Firestone High School. Um, I wanted to chat with you today a little bit about the concept of impairment as it relates to the Cuyahoga River. Um, this is something that's been brought up as a concern by residents, so I just wanted to touch on that. Um, Ohio EPA, as required under the Clean Water Act, um, reviews and evaluates the ability of streams across the state to support beneficial uses. Um, those include consumption of fish, recreation, uh, drinking water, and the ability to support um, aquatic life. So I think everybody in here uh, would agree that the uh, Cuyahoga River, River has a long history, famous history of impairment, um, but that's something that's not unique across the state. Um, EPA evaluates approximately 1,500 water bodies uh, in Ohio, and about 1,400 of those, about 90% are considered impaired. Um, but what's really remarkable is that over the last 50 years, um, in part due to the Clean Water Act and other initiatives, we've seen um, a strong improvement in the physical, chemical, and biological characteristics of our water bodies. And the Cuyahoga is one of those that has seen uh, a rebirth in the quality of the river. Uh, recently, uh, in the last couple years, Ohio EPA, through um, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, uh, proposed delisting three of the beneficial use impairments identified um, under the Cuyahoga Area of Concern, and that was approved by US EPA. Um, around the Riverwoods development, the Cuyahoga River um, is actually considered to be fully in attainment for its aquatic life use designation. So the river is healthy. It's able to support diverse fish and stream, uh, fish and macroinvertebrate bug communities in the river. Um, and the, the Riverwoods development really does uh, present a great opportunity to further improve the health of the river. Riparian area protection and restoration is critically important for um, our streams. They provide shade, uh, woody debris and detritus, habitat, important nutrient and sediment filtration. Um, and this development is going to further that cause. Um, like Derek, I'm not gonna be available tonight at seven due to prior commitments, but I'm also available if there are any questions, um, feel free to call or email me. Um, and I appreciate your time, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Snowden. Thank you, um, Mr. Uh, Petros. Hello, how are you? Uh, my name is Sam Petros. My address is 10474 Broadview Road. I thank you very much for taking your time to review this issue with us. Uh, we are builders and developers and we build and developed uh, actually in Summit County, probably 60 to $100 million a year of product over the last four to five years in Richfield and Boston Heights and Cuyahoga Falls. And we look forward to being able to develop this in Akron. This is a $40 million investment <clears throat> into the community. Um, it's not unusual for us. We've built a lot of buildings and a lot of multifamily and maintain them and manage them and keep them. And uh, this project will bring in people who will spend money in the Valley, enjoy the Valley, be good stewards of the valley. They're people who are interested in being there and want to live there. And at the same time, create public open space that's, e that's ecologically correct. So we believe that we're going to create income tax through the people that live there and pay it. We're going to create taxes through our own building and investment in it. 15 years from now, it's probably going to be worth $60 million and it'll pay full taxes to Akron, into the schools, into everyone for the rest of its existence, which should be hundreds of years. Um, the project itself <clears throat> is 73% green space with a great big conservation on the river side. And we're proud to do this and people wanna be here. The businesses in that valley need these people to spend 
and pick it up, it's backsliding. Anybody can see that. There's no arguing it, it's obvious. I think it'll really do a big turnaround for the valley. And I remember that valley 25, 30 years ago. I used to go down to Scando and hit all the bars and restaurants. As you can see, I don't go to Scando anymore. Um, but uh, it, it's kind of a shame. And I believe this is gonna be a great opportunity to turn it around. And I wanna point out something that's extremely important. These are private roads, totally owned by us and managed by us. We have no demand on services for the city of Akron, except police and fire. So we plow the roads, we repair all that infrastructure, we maintain all the infrastructure, we do all of our trash. The only thing that we'll ask from the city of Akron is police and fire. So no, no economic pull on the city, just a pure plus all the way around. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, at this point, we'll ask uh, Eric Allen, if uh, Eric Allen is present. Yes, I'm here. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Very good. Um, well, I'm, I represent the uh, construction management uh, arm of the, uh, of the project. Um, I'm with 5-1 Construction. If you could please provide fresh uh, address. Yep, I'm going to get that for you right now. I'm going to get my camera on first. Um, uh, Eric Allen, my Pride One address is 2211 Medina Road, Suite 100, Medina, Ohio. Um, I represent the uh, construction management arm of this project, should it take off. Um, Petros has teamed up with us uh, as uh, Pride One has done. Um, about 10,000 of these units across the country. Um, we are very excited to be part of this project being in uh, Northeast Ohio and Medina. It's great to bring this style of living um, uh, to Akron, Ohio. It's a town I was born and raised in. Um, I think it's, a, it's a, a great opportunity to bring more people, like Mr. Petro said, uh, into the Valley to experience it. Uh, there's so many things to offer. Uh, we're very excited to be part of something that is so open to um, and cooperating with a conservation district to bring more people to that section of the river that for many, many years, uh, the only way it could even be observed would be to uh, you know, play on the golf course. Uh, this is going to be something that people will live by. They will visit. The public will be able to visit the trails. Um, I'm excited about the idea of the, uh, uh, the, the canoe livery. Um, we're very excited about it. We hope people consider it and see it for the opportunity that it that it uh, it truly is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Thank you, I uh, Travis Crane. Can you please provide for us your name and address. Sure, uh, Travis Crane, Davy Resource Group, thirteen ten Sharon Copley Road, Sharon Center, Ohio four four two seven four. I'm a colleague of Greg Snowden with Davy Resource Group. I was involved with the land planning, will be involved with the civil engineering and surveying of this project. Um, a lot of well-spoken comments here. I, I really have nothing further to add. I'm here to answer any questions regarding stormwater management, land planning, um, civil engineering and surveying. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marshall Pitchford. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Marshall Pitchford, and I am working with the, uh, the Petros Group. Uh, our address is 209 South Main Street, uh, third floor, right here in uh, Akron. And I, I, too, am here to simply answer any questions and provide uh, further guidance and uh, appreciate the committee and council's uh, time today. Thank you. Uh, Don uh, Pollock? Pollock? Impact Group. Is there a Don Polyak on the call? I don't believe he's going to speak, Mr. Fusco. I think he's just monitoring. Okay, very good. After that, we have uh, John uh, Kerezi. Kerezi. John Carezzi. 
Okay, going once, going twice. We don't know if we have them on the call, uh, apparently, so we'll move on to the next. Uh, Joe Scassio. Scassio, Joe Scassio. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, this is John York. I just wondered if maybe we could ask IT support to let us know if anybody's in the waiting room. There is no one currently in the waiting room. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I also don't see anyone with that name in the participants list. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We don't want to miss anyone. We want to hear from everyone. Um, is there a Tony Jaber? Is Tony Jaber. I do not see anyone with that name in the participants list. Okay, very good. We, um, we basically, just for, the, uh, for everyone's uh, benefit, uh, we had a number of people request uh, to speak before uh, the committee and before council. And so um, uh, that's the, the list that we have here. And that's the names that I'm calling out, those who uh, may have requested to speak. So, okay, with that, um, is there anyone else wishing to speak in favor? Um, anyone else? I do see a Jim Yannick. Yannick? Jim Yannick? Do we have a Jim Yannick? I do not have anyone with that name in the guest list. Okay. And Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, very good. I'm going to ask then, is there anyone here that wishes to speak in favor of this conditional use request? Anyone that wishes to speak in favor, if you can unmute yourself and uh, say, hey, I want to say something in favor. Okay. Not hearing anyone. Very good. Thank you. Um, so now what we'll do is we'll ask if there's anyone here wishing to speak against this proposal. I will call you out by name. Okay. And if you could please provide again for the committee your name and address. All right. And if I pronounce your name wrong, I apologize in advance. So the first one we have is Walter C. Davis. Is there a Walter C. Davis here? Yes, sir. Oh, yes, Mr. Davis. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Walter Davis. My address is 4411 Quick Road, Peninsula, Ohio, 44264. For the past 11 years, I have had the privilege of serving as superintendent of the Woodridge Local School District. As a local school district, our boundaries extend into multiple municipalities. We serve families in Caga Falls, Akron, Peninsula, and many other communities. In fact, the city of Akron is second only to Caga Falls in neighborhoods that are part of the Woodridge Local School District. Many of your resident children are Woodridge Bulldogs. When the city of Akron seeks to grow population through residential development using schemes that offer developers and businesses tax abatement, the Woodridge Local School District loses. With no say in the matter, our board is assuming responsibility for the education of Akron resident children without tax support for the 15 year term of the abatement. Such is already the case in the Heron Crest neighborhood and now Proposed developments in and around the valley will add kids with little, little or no revenue. In essence, residents of our other neighborhoods, other cities even, have to underwrite the costs to educate these students coming from Akron homes for the term of the abatements you've provided. In commercial abatement scenarios, there are often incentives or payments in lieu of taxes that are offered to schools as a way of offsetting the losses. Thus far with this proposed development, there has been no discussion, no talk at all with the schools about anything, let alone any financial incentives. With abatement, schools are the biggest losers. This year, a Woodridge education will cost over $11,000 per child. As a district that receives less than $700 per pupil in state aid, we are heavily reliant on property tax revenues for the majority of our budget. With development comes additional children. With abated development comes additional children and no property tax receipts to cover the costs incurred for a period of time. 
It is our understanding that a master planning process is already being planned for the Merriman Valley with both the city of Akron and the city of Kaga Falls funding and participating in the work. Why approve development in the valley now prior to that planning process? Why not wait to ensure that whatever development can occur should occur as the communities collaborate to develop and implement a vision for the valley for what it could and should be. As clear stakeholders in what happens in this part of your city, the Woodridge Board of Education and leadership team urge you to pause, delay all development in the Merriman Valley until the master planning process is completed. As the school district that serves this region, we in the Woodridge schools look forward to being part of that process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Thank you. Um, I'll ask uh, Emily A. Collins. Uh, Emily is present. Emily A. Collins. I am present. Oh, good, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Emily Collins. I am a resident at 859 Bloomfield Avenue uh, in Akron 44302, and that's the fourth ward. Um, I'm also an environmental attorney and uh, work at an organization called Fair Shake Environmental Legal Services as the executive director and managing attorney. Um, my re remarks today are entirely focused on water quality and the city of Akron's ability to ensure that what's known as uh, non-point source runoff, which is not regulated by state and federal environmental agencies um, is addressed and should be the burden of the land developer rather than residents and ratepayers of the city of Akron. Akron's code at section 153.474 requires adequate evidence that the conditional use will not create excessive additional requirements at public cost for pub public services, will not be detrimental to the economic welfare of the community, and will not result in the destruction loss or damage of a natural scenic or historic feature of major importance. And I think the Cuyahoga River certainly constitutes an, um, a feature of major importance to, to the residents of Akron. The proposed ordinance um, before you today and the petition materials simply do not provide a detailed stormwater erosion or sedimentation um, set of data that would give me the ability to actually critique it. Um, instead, the proposed ordinance kicks the can down the road so that detailed plans will be provided after the petition is approved and after public participation opportunities are largely eliminated. On June 25th, 2020, so just this past summer, the National Park Service presented on its options for dealing with two major threats to the Cuyahoga River in the Boston Mills area. Those threats are land cover changes from development and increased precipitation. The proposed ordinance at section one, uh, paragraph six and seven refer to detailed engineering plans about controlling runoff, siltation and sedimentation. Also bank stabilization analyses that are going to be provided apparently at a later date. So to comply with the evidence requirements and dealing with those two major threats to the Cuyahoga River Valley, um, in protecting you know, our future of major importance. Those detailed plans should be provided for public review and critique prior to consideration, full consideration of the ordinance. So normally I'd be able to provide you with expert analysis of those, those plans and give you more evidence myself uh, or through testimony of experts, but here it's only the developer who will be doing that at a later date. And to provide the public with an adequate uh, participation opportunity, I'd like to see those analyses required prior to issuance of the petition um, and approval of the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Ms. Collins, thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to ask um, W. Stewart Buchanan, please. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for letting us uh, speak uh, on the uh, the issue. My name is Stuart Buchanan. Uh, my address is 1898 Akron Peninsula Road. That's 44313. I happen to own the building at this address. 
and my property fronts on Akron Peninsula Road and goes back to the property line for the proposed new housing development of, of uh, 28 homes and 169 apartments, I think for 197 units. This is way too many housing units in this limited space. It doesn't make sense to put housing right next to my property line, which is commercial use property. In addition, it's a housing development right on the property line. My neighboring eight or nine properties that go from Akron Peninsula Road back to the development need more space between our property line and the houses. The houses right now are scheduled to be built right on our property line. There's plenty of acreage for the developer to put up the houses more in the middle of the project if this conditional use has to be uh, changed. Maybe as an alternative with the space available, put up only homes and more expensive homes to make it nicer and more attractive rather than the 197 units jammed in in that small space that they have currently projected in. I know they have some extra space for uh, open space, but uh, the units are jammed in right against all of our commercial properties. I'm not sure how you're gonna regulate the quality of the tenants, which was referred to earlier about uh, uh, having uh, um, all great, all great people, because who controls who the tenants are that move in? It seems to me somewhere along the line that Akron needs to have a development plan, which was discussed at the last meeting. And uh, at the last meeting, the vote was not to approve the change, but then, then the previous vote not to approve the change was changed by the planning commission after the meeting. So I'm not clear clear what our next step might be to change, to stop the change of the conditional use. So that's just sort of my perspective and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Thank you for your comments. Uh, next, I'd like to ask Beth Field uh, to please join us. And if you could please provide for us your name and address. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Hi, thanks, Jeff. Um, my name is Beth Vild. Uh, I am the COO and Director of Programming of the Big Love Network. We are an environmental health equity organization concentrated on the area of Akron, Ohio. My uh, address is 1111 Cary Avenue, Akron, Ohio, 44314. Um, I would like to speak uh, and to not be redundant to what the great work that the residents in this neighborhood have done um, in looking at this development and their fears around uh, developing along our riparian edge throughout the valley. Um, I would like to question the strategy of urban sprawl that is being presented here for higher income, for a higher income neighborhood. When we are currently in the process, um, through the mayor's office at looking at racial equity issues throughout our city. Um, and looking at our Guinea index number, which is a representative of income inequality in our area um, that goes between zero and one, Akron is at a 0.5 along with San Francisco. Cleveland is at a 0.49, Toledo is at a 0.46, Columbus is at a 0.44, and the US average is 0.48. That means that our income inequality in the city is stark and very large. Um, people make fun of how bad the income inequality is in San Francisco, but we have that right here in Akron, Ohio, where one in four Akron residents live in poverty. This is in large amount because of the way that we historically have developed the city. If you currently look at the eviction maps um, that show how many evictions are happening in our city, which we are aware is a crisis, you can see it near the red line districting maps of the 1920s uh, to 40s. Um, that means that evictions are happening um, in underdeveloped neighborhoods um, and here we are, the last day of the year, during a pandemic, trying to push through a development for wealthier housing that is not going to benefit our school district, that has a 15-year tax abatement, and we will not see the return on that, and excludes 
the current proposal to create a plan for the valley. Now, why this is problematic is because as we've seen destination cities grow, that is because of the quality of life that is provided within those cities. We know that our city has very stark health disparities that also mirror the eviction map and the red line districting map. We should be concentrating on increasing people's quality of life, especially during a pandemic where people's water is getting shut off, where people are getting evicted from their homes and not be trying to last minute push through wealthy subsidized housing. I suggest that this gets uh, voted down if Petros is not willing to work with the community in the development of this, and if Petros is willing to work with the development, with the community and the neighbors that have put together an excellent plan around based on economic revitalization of the area, that then it gets suspended. And that is my recommendation. Thank you for my for your time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Field. Uh, next, we'd like to welcome uh, Council Representative from Cuyahoga Falls, Frank Stams. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman Fusco. And uh, my name is Frank Stams. I got to find page one here quickly. There we go. And I live at 3294 Smeadow, Cuyahoga Falls. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I'm grateful for this opportunity in front of you uh, and the committee this afternoon. And I, I certainly will respect that time. Uh, as the Ward 8 Councilman in here in Cuyahoga Falls, I feel it is my duty uh, to voice the concerns of my constituents and our school district, Woodridge, which you heard from earlier, uh, that will be affected by the decisions today. Uh, as I'm sure the committee knows, a joint master plan for the Merriman Valley between Akron and Cuyahoga Falls has been agreed to and currently is underway. And I understand that a consulting firm will shortly be um, named, uh, hopefully by the end of the year. Uh, Cuyahoga Falls and Akron have significant tax dollars uh, invested in this master plan, I think to the tune roughly of about $140,000 combined. Uh, I respectfully ask the committee today to stay or table their decision on this proposed development until a short or, or medium or, or short until a short, medium and long term master plan has been completed. Uh, I feel that it is both prudent and responsible uh, to pause this in this development until the master plan is completed to ensure its harmony. Uh, with the Merriman Valley uh, and uh, all the time and, and, and money and, and, and energy put into the master plan spent so far and will be spent. Uh, in addition, um, uh, the tax abatement. Um, I would like to make uh, one quick comment on the tax abatement. Um, I do not feel that this tax abatement is socially just. I repeat, it is not socially just. With regards to the unfunded population, the Woodridge school system will receive and be responsible for. Uh, you heard firsthand earlier the amount of money uh, surrounding uh, this project and the developer. Uh, and again, that should, should just state, uh, you know, the, some of the social inequities or, uh, that we see in today's world. So uh, I want to say thank you for, for very much for your time uh, this afternoon. I appreciate it. And um, again, again, thank you. That, that's all. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, have Andrew Holland uh, with Preserve the Valley, Preserve the Valley organization. Uh, Mr. Holland. Thank you, Chairman Fusco. Um, my name is Andrew Holland and my address is 2079 Zurich Trail. I'm an Akron-based business owner, an active volunteer in our community, and a member of the Preserve the Valley Citizens Action Coalition. Our mission is to engage and amplify citizens' voices in protecting and planning for the future of the Cuyahoga Valley region. We currently have 280 activated and 8,000 aware citizens in our group. The media has recently characterized these council meetings as potentially contentious. We want, to know, we want you to know that our contention is not our goal. 
We are engaged in this process as fellow citizens that want the best for our community. Our goal believes in vision-driven, community-focused development and conservation. It is our hope that all stakeholders, city and county government, developers, business owners, parks, schools, and citizens have a voice in creating the vision for the Cauga Valley during the pending master planning process. However, we understand that decisions regarding the Riverwood development may be necessary before the master planning process can be completed. Within our Riverwood planning brief that we sent out to all council members, preserving the valley has defined key issues that need to be addressed as this potential development traverses the planning and approval process. We provide the Riverwood briefing in the spirit of citizens helping citizens to understand these issues and the potential impact on the community. I would like to present an overview of one of these issues and a potential solution. The unnecessary tax abatement, the community reinvestment abatement. City planner, planner Mr. Jason Segedy said recently in a Devil Strip article, if the real estate market takes off in a certain neighborhoods, the city could remove those areas from the program to attempt to spur growth in other parts of Akron. Data provided to our, to our group by a real estate professional with expertise in the Valley shows evidence of a very successful market. Homes are going under contract in 24 to 48 hours with an average selling price of $225,711. Additional data on the success of the Valley market is provided in our brief. And Councilman Kamer, I understand that you have expertise in the area and urge you to review the information on page five of our brief with your fellow council members. Petros Development clearly understands the value of the Cauga Valley market as they have launched three developments in the past three years and are seeking two additional developments. We believe that the $13.77 million abatement is not necessary to encourage development in the Valley and represents a divestment from the community versus an investment in the community. We do, however, have also concern over items that show up in the developer's plans as proposed. So the proposed canoe livery, the proposed trail connector, the proposed bridge to connect to the valley. Those are infrastructure projects that need to have roles and responsibilities inclusive of initial funding and ongoing maintenance. We also have concerns with regards to the uh, floodplain reclamation and the cost that it will take to, be, to convert that project. We believe that removal of the abatement and introduction of a potential TIF program could fund these projects to ensure if this development is going to go forward, that it is congruent with the future vision of the Valley and it does further the Valley. This is something that we want you to, uh, to, to review our, our council brief we also want to welcome any questions or concerns to our group. We want this to be an open dialogue. We fear that it has become a game of telephone tag through the media, and therefore we have provided our telephone numbers as well as our email addresses and encourage council to reach out to us if they have any questions or concerns. We appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, Mr. Holland, thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to ask um, Nicholas Lesser, Nicholas Flesser. Yes, sir. Okay, Chairman, welcome. Thank you, sir. It's nice to be here. And straight ahead, I hope uh, I hope everybody on the committee is doing well. My name is Nicholas Flesser. I live at 432 South Rose Boulevard in Akron, Ohio, a long-term resident of the Fighting Fourth Ward. And my purpose in, in speaking with you today is to also touch on the notion of the tax abatements. I think Mr. Holland, of course, raises some, some very worthwhile issues, but I'd like to also touch on the regressive nature of these tax abatements as proposed. And candidly, leaving $14 million on the table is, is, is a lot of money. For, you know, we're not gonna get any return on this for 15 years. And on the city's website, there's a document called the City of Akron Ongoing Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Efforts. And one of the stated goals in that document is to bridge the disparities in investment across Akron's neighborhoods and to encourage the private sector to assist property owners in rehabbing the city's historic housing stock. And it's very plain to me that the proposed abatements for the Riverwood development 
are counter to the city's stated goals. This is not historic housing stock and it's concentrated in, in the wealthier um, Ward 8. And I also think the idea of asking residents across all of Akron's wards to effectively subsidize services for this higher end housing development are very regressive in nature. I just don't see the equity in this. Furthermore, I respectfully challenge the members of, of this committee to consider how the, the constituents in your wards will react to this when it's plain to them that they're subsidizing folks in $270,000 homes when the average home value in, in the city of Akron is $116,000. Again, it just doesn't seem um, equitable to me. And I would also ask that you review the uh, council briefing document that Preserve the Valley put together. There's a lot of time and effort that went into that. And I think there's some very good information in there for members of this committee and the council at large to consider. I thank you very much for your time and attention here this afternoon. And most importantly, I hope you all have a very pleasant and healthy holiday season. Thank you, Mr. Flesser. Thank you for your time. Uh, I, I would like to next invite uh, Caitlin McCauley. Uh, and please provide for us your name and address. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, thank you. My name is Caitlin McCauley and I live at 1719 Akron Peninsula Road. Understandably, there is a deep desire to grow the population of Akron and Cuyahoga Falls. Residents of these cities have been witness to what is now three partnerships with Petros Development Group with the intention of creating residential developments that will entice citizens to move back from the suburbs. These developments include woodland preserves and villas off Surik Trail, the villages at Sycamore off Akron Peninsula Road and now Riverwood. In 2018, a plan was proposed by Petros to build 88 houses on 65 acres off Cirque Trail. This particular, particular area is plagued by steep dips in the road resulting in blind spots that disable one's ability to see what's ahead. During the city planning meetings, Mr. Greg Modick repeatedly stated that the north-south segment of Cirque Trail would be modified to reduce the problematic protrusions that disturb sight lines towards the east-west bend in the road. The development has since been completed and no improvements were ever made to address these issues. In 2019, the same developer applied for residential rezoning to build 146 townhomes on the former 28-acre Sycamore Valley Golf Course. Initially, Petros presented their plans with the inclusion of a walking trail, preservation of the property's historic white barn, and management of the green space. With the promises of these amenities, Petros was able to secure a approval from city council for a zoning change. By the end of the planning process, both the barn and trail connectors were labeled as, quote, to be done by others, and the ownership of the green space has been relinquished to an undesignated third party. So here we are for the third time, facing months of prior planning between the city of Akron and Petros Development Group, with no citizen involvement, only to be sold another empty vision with the promise of enhanced community benefits, but none of the legislation that will ensure its completion. In the November 20th Planning Commission meeting, Mr. Modick detailed a list of items that he is looking to accomplish at Riverwood. I quote, replanting of the floodplain, we're also going to provide public access, let the people get down to the river via trails. There's a potential to look at a canoe launch point as well as the possibility of a future pedestrian bridge to cross the Cuyahoga and get over to the towpath. Aside from the rehabilitation of the floodplain by West Creek Conservancy, there is no actual funding or partners identified to undertake and maintain this list of improvements and restoration made by Mr. Modick. Referencing the map, the proposed public walking path leads directly out to Akron Peninsula, a 35 mile an hour road with blind spots, high traffic and no sidewalks. It's hard for one to appreciate the functionality of a public path that is only immediately accessible to the, re to the residential community directly adjacent to it, and which lacks a public parking lot, connectivity to other trails and safe accessibility by bike or on foot, as there are no sidewalks planned anywhere outside of this development. The idea of a pedestrian bridge over the river is very enticing. It's important to note that the conditional use permit submitted by Petros only holds them responsible for an easement for this idyllic and presumably very expensive future bridge. Mr. Modick noted that the Cuyahoga River is, quote, one of the greatest assets in this area. I would venture to guess that sentiment is what inspired the idea for the canoe launch point that has no responsible party tied to its manifestation. Mr. Modick also mentioned, 
we've really embraced the idea of conservation development, noting that this plan boasts 48 acres of public open space, which is 62% of the project. What was not mentioned is that 45 of those 48 acres referred to as open space are predominantly in the FEMA identified unbuildable floodplain. Donated is one word, time is up. another. For each of these suggested amenities, I would love to see the details for planning, funding, and maintenance written into the final approved legislation for this flood prone site prior to any advancement of this proposed development. Once is Thank you. I apologize, Ms. McCauley. If you could please wrap up. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, once is random, twice is chance, three times is a pattern. Our observation and our fear is that we are dealing with a pattern by the Petro Development Group to garner approval from city council based on promises that they never intend to keep. I'll Thank end you. with the first definition I was taught when I studied design, gestalt, an organized whole that is perceived as more than the sum of its parts. The Merriman Valley, along with its residents, current and future, deserve to have a master plan put in place prior to the continued habit of developing this land as Thank individual you. parts instead of pieces as the organized whole. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next, I'd like to invite uh, Gina Burke, please. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, Gina. Good afternoon. My name is Gina Burke, 1701 Akron Peninsula Road, 44313. I want to thank the uh, council members and the city for uh, your service at this time. It's a deeply, I deeply respect your work and the time you're taking to make the hard calls. In these incredibly difficult, uncertain times we face as the health and financial COVID budget crisis faces us. I'm extremely concerned and question the prudence of this time, at this time of this conditional use and tax abatement for this developer. Especially concerning are there conservation, water quality, public access promises made in order to win approval. Behind me, at Sycamore, 100 feet from my front door and a quarter mile away from Riverwoods, you see their mirror proposal with no obligation to fulfill as they are solely responsible to determine their water quality conservation plans based on cost to them. Remarkably, they won favor in the falls by calling the work of the Summit Metro Parks at Valley View a mess of a wasteland, while they added more impervious surface runoff and compensated with bigger and bigger open toxic detention ponds without shade, filtration plants, or barriers protecting children and pets in the floodplain encroaching on that pathway. In addition to the no obligation greenway planned on the southern border mentioned by Caitlin, along the north border, they have encroached seven feet into a 10 feet scenic easement that helped them offset access to their green spate losses and eliminated the promised water fountain in the big pit along Akron Peninsula Road. Akron cannot afford to lower the bar on the Cog, as Cog Falls did. Compliance is not a feature and benefit. We experienced the consequences of this development group's upstream suburban sprawl runoff, which defines Cog Falls, and from which they seem to be under no obligation to build appropriate impervious surface to, downstream in the floodplain. Cog Falls approved their plan before the de developer was even aware of the exposed Akron sewer trunk line on this property in the easement on the south side. I've sent to you letters showing how hard we tried and worked to work, to work with this developer. I've sent you the Northeast Ohio Sustainable Cities Consortium Plan, the Master Plan RFP, the Recreation Economy Statistics, and the EPA watershed management criteria and statistics on bikeway and statistics on bikeway mobility safety issues that must get addressed. Finally, I recently made a donation to the Akron Public Schools for new safety football helmets in the Kenmore Garfield student athletes. Why do they need donations for basic sports equipment? Our schools are underfunded 
This is a tax abatement given to a developer to put students, Akron students in Woodridge schools. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Ms. Burt. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for your comments. Uh, Shelly Pearsall. Yes, I'm here. You're welcome. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like to thank the committee for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm Shelly Pearsall. I live at 1660 Smoke Rise Drive in Akron. Um, I'm a member of Preserve the Valley. Um, because of my previous work with Hale Farm and Village and also with the Cleveland Metro Park System, I'd like to focus on the conservation planning aspects of Riverwood, specifically the, the money involved and what we're talking about. As Caitlin mentioned, um, much of the gifted land um, is floodplain and you can check that out on the FEMA map in the um, briefing materials that we, we gave you. I'd also, I'd like to point out that there's a big difference bet between setting aside property for conservation and recreation and uh, restoration and actually making that happen. And I'm gonna use the Valley View Golf Course as an example because there are some comparisons between what is being proposed um, for Riverwood and what has already happened at Valley View Golf Course. Um, the site of Valley View is larger than Riverwood. It's about 200 acres compared to the 45 acres um, that we're talking about with Riverwood. But um, plans for the Valley View Golf Course call for restoring the golf course to its natural state, which is something that you heard uh, Mr. Modoc say, creating a natural floodplain area, which you also heard, and creating a, a kayak launch area. I just like to um, put some numbers behind those um, behind those projects. Summit Metro Parks has already spent $1.5 million just for the restoration of the land. Um, they've projected that the restoration of the waterway and building that canoe launch access and also doing some bank restoration and some river rerouting will be another 2.5 million. So if you look at that total cost, we're talking more than $4 million to do the restoration at the Valley View Golf, Golf Course. And if you take Riverwood as a portion of that, we're probably looking at about a million dollars, um, close to a million dollars to, um, to do the restoration at Riverwood. And that's not including the bridge construction. Um, bridge or uh, trail access has al also been promised for Riverwood. And my question, especially having worked for the Cleveland Metro Parks, is who's going to fund the, the, the building of that, that trail? And especially who's going to maintain it? Um, trails cost between $1,000 and $2,000 per mile per year to maintain. And that's a trail in a pretty good location. This is, these are trails that are going to be built in the floodplain area, according to the maps. And so that they're going to take a lot of ongoing maintenance and there's no names behind um, you know, who's going to do that maintenance is it going to be the city of Akron um, who's going to pay for um, pay for that um, ongoing maintenance to make it a usable public space. West Creek has been identified as the agency in charge of restoration. Mr. Schaefer mentioned um, that they have a larger budget now for restoration, by, but I encourage everyone to look back at the, um, the financials, which are available on their website. For 2018, their budget was $200,000, and that's for the restoration that they do for all of their sites. They, they receive a lot of grant funding, and they work with a lot of partner agencies to make the big restoration projects that they do happen. Um, and so it's important that we start to look at who are the, um, you know, who are the, the, the partners that are, gonna, that are gonna do this. Um, Thank you, Ms. Pearsall. I ask that you please wrap, wrap it up, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, uh, I have two questions for Mr. Modick. What does your analysis show for the re restoration of this riverfront? And who have you reached out to as regional partners? I'd like to see some of the partners that we normally work with. I'm going to end with one quote from um, uh, Mike Johnson at the Valley View Golf Course. With the Cuyahoga River, the Towpath Trail, and the Cuyahoga Valley Scenic Railroad, I see Valley View as a world-class recreation destination destination. I see the same potential at Riverwood, and I believe much more thought, planning, and cultivation of partnerships needs to go into this site, and it should be paused until more planning can be done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, uh, Jody uh, Grassgreen, uh, you're next. Um, I'm going to ask again if we could please be mindful of our time. Thanks for pronouncing my name. my correctly. fingers. That means three minutes. Okay. Jody Grassgreen, 699 Weber Avenue, 37 year resident, 37 year resident of Highland Square, proud member of PTV. My kids went to school with James and with Gregory. Thank you for your time and consideration regarding Valley development. Please consider what we do know and is outlined in your PTV brief on pages six through eight. We do know that it is the Cuyahoga River still is listed as an EPA area of concern. 
and we know that Akron's riparian setbacks are below those recommended by the Ohio EPA. We also know that the valley's precipitation has increased about an inch a decade, leading to stormwater in the river each year due in part to residential development. And we do know all the residents of Akron will continue to pay increases in their water bills due to the billion dollar sewer upgrades meant to protect the waters of the Cuyahoga River to address storm water runoff. All residents paying for this sewer upgrade will be subsidizing any Valley housing project. We know whether you care about the environment or not, we are all paying the price of its degradation caused by residential development. While it's laudable Akron is involved in getting rid of the dam, such as the Gorge Dam, it is contradictory to put time and money on one part of the river while degrading it somewhere else. That's not how water or the environment works. And we know that the, Mer the Valley's Merriman Portage intersection saw an in increase of total crashes and crash, rate, crash rates from 2016 through 2019. And page 12 of your uh, brief mentions that outward growth detracts from the legacy city where we have infrastructure and amenities already. And that to continue outward growth takes services, attention and funding away from the legacy city wards. We know that a phase one environmental assessment is not an environmental impact study. Now, what we don't know and has been brought up is how much storm water, wa water runoff will be created and what will it cost the residents of Akron in the future? And again, who's going to pay to erect and maintain Mr. Petros's bridge and launch since it's not in the plan? Why do we need a comprehensive stakeholder driven master plan? I respectfully will point out that within the last 50 years or so, city planners have displaced a largely, largely African-American neighborhood and replaced it with a freeway to nowhere and now a closed inner belt. We have several housing developments that are isolated with no sidewalks outside of the development, including the very newest Hickory Memorial Parkway where the children who may reside there cannot walk to their neighborhood King LLC at this time. Ms. Green, to... if you okay, one up. more sentence. I got one more sentence. Okay. People say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. Imagine growing the population and economy with innovation. Imagine the Horrigan Riverwood Environmental Education Center and Recreation Area. Thank you so much for your thoughtful service to the citizens of Athens. Thank you, Ms. Grass Green. Thank you. Uh, Hallie Bowie. We have Hallie Bowie. Yes. Oh, Good afternoon. Welcome. My, my name's Hallie Bowie. I'm, uh, uh, my address is 1867 Brookshire Road in Akron 44313. Um, I am uh, an architect uh, who specializes in residential work uh, for pretty much my entire adult career here. And I've also spent that time as a resident of Akron. Um, one thing I'd like to point out here uh, is that regarding in environmental friendliness, uh, the developers said that this was an environmentally friendly development Aside from concerns about uh, impact on the river or um, impervious surfaces, there are criteria set forth by the lead environmental building standards uh, for determining what's an environmentally friendly site. And this site does not fit those descriptions. Um, an environmentally friendly de development site is one that is uh, either on previously developed site um, location so that you are providing, a, for instance, infill housing. Um, it's already served by existing infrastructure with water lines and sewer lines and so forth, uh, as well as roads. And it also has connection to important community services, 
such as schools and libraries and shopping locations. Um, this development does not fit any of that criteria. It is in a section kind of remote unto itself. It will be impossible for anybody to go from a home in this new development to a library or a school without having access to a vehicle, which again speaks to um, equity issues. Um, and in fact, the ability of the residents to continue paying their rents, which this is also primarily a rental property as opposed to owned by the people living in it. Um, but if, if you have to be putting money into a car in order to make it viable to live in this place, that's money that's not going to be available to continue paying rents in times of economic distress. Um, and also the, this location is unique. It is not like most other sites. You know, there are other places where we can build the population of Akron, which is an important goal. Um, just to wrap up, I'd like to say that I've found that the design process goes best when it receives input from clients. And in this case, the members of the community are clients. Um, I've got a good deal of respect for our planning department, but we need to come back. And sometimes the client says, you need to change, change direction. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, Heather uh, Hillenbrand is uh, next. It's Helen Hillenbrand. Hi. Here, okay, thank yeah. you. Again, I, I'm gonna ask that we try to stick to the three minutes, please. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, my address is 657 Acton Road. I am a recent transfer to Akron. My husband and I worked very hard to save money to buy our first house in Akron. I feel very excited about an equitable plan for development in Akron, and to me, this isn't it. I'm asking my council members to let the community participate in democracy by participating in a long-term planning process. I think that we all deserve to have access to the beautiful natural resources in Akron, and I don't see this development as allowing that. I think that this contributes to the hollowing out of the inner city and also to the degradation of our infrastructure by adding a bunch of cars to roads that aren't necessarily set up for them. I would like to see more planning around that. I want to see all of the necessary research done before we rush ahead with this. And I just think that it would be most appropriate if we could wait and all participate in this process together. I also am an employee of Akron Public Schools. I don't feel good about sliding another school district when I realize how much need there are in many student populations. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Helen Brand, and welcome to Akron. Uh, next, I'd like to ask, and I'm probably not gonna do well with this name, I'm sorry. Uh, Jessica Fijak, uh, F I J. That's okay. Hi. A okay. If you could please, I Hello. apologize. <laughs> I'm Jessica Fialkovich. I live at 190 North Portage Path, um, which is in Ward 1. And uh, first, I would like to say that I back the Preserve the Valley's efforts in saying that there must be a pause, if not a halt, in developing the Cuyahoga Valley under until the master plan process is completed. I think that a six month moratorium is reasonable and it would allow for more thoughtful planning in terms of accessibility, housing inequities, preservation of stolen indigenous land and possible ecotourism. Um, today, I'd like to bring up the issue of accessibility. Uh, living in Highland Square, I am in close proximity to the Chicago Valley. I frequent CVNP, the towpath, and San Juan Metro Park multiple times any given week. And although I am not far from a handful of these trailheads, getting there safely requires that I travel by car. Uh, I have noticed that the same goes for residents of the North Hill neighborhood and even those that live directly in the Cuyahoga Valley. Uh, sidewalks connecting these neighborhoods to the parks or even everyday amenities in the valley are in most places non-existent and crossing the main intersections has proven to be dangerous. Um, the proposed Riverwood development 
represents a local trend of creating isolated housing developments and rental complexes without connectivity or walkability to the local and national park areas. It's important to note that currently this area has a walk score of four and a bike score of one, and that's based on a scale of 100. For folks with varying physical abilities, accessibility needs to go beyond walkability and bikeability so that these amenities are accessible to all. Um, I'd also like to note that the plans provided by Petro's call for two points of entry from Akron Peninsula Road, which are car access only. There are no sidewalks or dedicated bike lanes in this area. As others have mentioned with Akron's goal of increasing the population of 250,000 by 2050, building more unaffordable isolated developments at the edge of the city, such as Riverwood is not the answer. If not carefully planned for, this development will look like more of the same. Uh, gentrification while existing historic neighborhoods continue to fall to the wayside or are erased entirely. Uh, we have done this before, as Jody mentioned with the erasure of a historic black neighborhood on Howard Street, which is now marked by a defunct highway. Deepening this divide in accessibility will further create, create inequities. Um, I urge you to pause developing this Cuyahoga Valley until the master planning process is completed. These plans must be made available to the public for critique, and we need a plan that serves the existing population of Akron so it can thrive. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to um, ask Alyssa, uh, Figueroa? Figueroa, that's okay. <laughs> Figueroa, okay, thank you. No worries. Hi, my name is Alyssa Figueroa. My address is 1725 Redwood Avenue in Akron, 44301. I'm in Ward 7. Um, I have lived in Akron for three years now. I hope to stay here for a very long time. And I am here today because as a registered nurse and a public health graduate student with a focus in health policy and management, I have concerns about the impact that the Riverwood construction will have on the health of Akronites. First, as is mentioned in the report from Preserve the Valley, the area in general remains largely car dependent. Not only does this create less opportunities for physical activity and leads to more sedentary lifestyle, it is especially detrimental to low income Akronites who rely on accessible sidewalks every day for access to public transportation or for walking to work. My other concern lies with the type of housing that will be constructed. With one in four Akronites living in poverty, our income inequality almost as bad as that of San Francisco and the median household income at about $37,000 a year Housing at the price point set at $230,000 or up to $2,000 a month is far out of reach for many in Akron. As mentioned in the report, our housing market is quite strong. What we lack is safe, affordable, low-income housing. Car-dependent, unaffordable housing mirrors the intentionally segregated suburbanization of the post-World War II era and exacerbates the existing inequalities in Akron. It is not in line with Akron's five-year strategic framework goal of increased justice and resource allocation and city planning and development. This development would continue to contribute to outward spread of new development while hollowing out the city center of resources. The older housing in the city lies in the center of Akron and has a mean age of 87 years, ranking 11th out of 15 pair cities for housing. Many of the city's low-income residents and residents of color live in these older homes. In maintaining its goals of increased equity in city planning processes, I feel that council should postpone further approval of development of the Cuyahoga Valley until 2021 master planning process is completed. I also feel that the city should conduct a health impact assessment to assess the health impact that this development will have on Akronites. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Figueroa. Uh, next, I would like to ask uh, Carolyn uh, Calbo. Carolyn Calbo, are you here? Yes, I am here. Um, I'm also here with my infant son, so uh, like <laughs> there might be some fun outbursts. Um, well, we welcome afternoon. both of you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, Akron City Council Planning Committee. Um, I am located at 2325 17th Street, Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. My name is Carolyn Colbo, and I graduated from the University of Akron in 2008 and then left the state of Ohio like many other millennials have done. After years in multiple states, my husband, another fellow Ohioan, and I made the decision to move home and raise a family here. I'm a public school educator and started my career as an educator with the Akron Public Schools Project RISE program. The reason I'm here today is as a concerned Falls resident. If you reference page 18 on the Preserve the Valley Riverwood brief provided to you, you can see that the boundary lines are bonkers between Cuyahoga Falls and Akron and the Merriman Valley. That means any decision that either city makes intimately affects the other area. 
The joint effort to create a master plan that includes a $50,000 investment from Akron will work to ensure that we plan in harmony with one another. I know that Mayor Horgan has the goal of growing Akron by 2050, and that's an important goal for council members. I do want to be sure to point out, though, in OID's five-year strategic framework, they cite that a successful application of the property tax abatement would include growing our homeowner populace. This Riverwood development would be a majority renters, and it's not in line with that goal of population growth. The current renters in the Merriman Valley don't even have access to safe sidewalks. It's very easy to notice along Portage Trail that you see children, people in wheelchairs regularly traversing on Portage Trails Road. If you drive up past CVS, it's very easy to see a small path that has been worn away in the grad because people that live there have no other way to walk to the local businesses in that area. A master planning process would allow us to answer many of the questions that have cropped up today in a meaningful way that doesn't burden city council with the sole responsibility and decision making here. We have willing and able citizens excited about examining these issues in depth. It's worth noting that no citizens have come forward today in support of this rezoning application. I am left with some questions um, and some answers that I still feel like we need from today. Earlier, Mr. Modick stated that, uh, or he shared, I should say, a map showing a proposed canoe and kayak launch, a pedestrian bridge, public paths, public parking. What guarantees can we put in place to ensure that this will happen? Who has responsibility? Who will fund this? How do we ensure this? Ms. McCauley told us about promises that have been broken with previous developments by the Pretrose group. How do we ensure that these promises are kept? Um, I, I know there's much more questions. I know my time's coming to an end. Uh, I really do wanna thank you guys for giving us this time and I'm more than happy to answer any questions uh, that come up as a member of Preserve the Valley. Thank you. Thank you. Three minutes exactly. Well done. <laughs> Next, I'd like to uh, welcome Scott Myers. Uh, Scott Myers, are you with us? Scott Myers? Uh, Jeff, he is not. He's okay. speaking tonight. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, very good. Uh, Barb Green, we'd like to invite Barb Green next. There you are. Hello, Barb Green. You're muted. If you could. Uh, Sorry. Uh, certainly. I'm Barb Green, and I live at 532 Parkside Drive, and I've been a Ward 8 resident for nearly 25 years. I think it's safe to say that work brought me here, but I landed in Ward 8 because of the trees in my backyard. And I'm a citizen who values and uses our national and metro parks a lot. I've raised a daughter who is an environmental educator on the shores of Lake uh, Erie. And I think I've learned a little bit from her. I've served on the boards of the Conservancy for our national park and countryside. And most importantly, I absolutely love this city. And I believe all of us come to you with a desire to be good citizens working in partnership with city council and our city staff. Uh, I'm coming up on the towards the caboose of this uh, litany of speakers, but I join my fellow citizens who have spoken before me and asking the city to postpone a decision on the development of the Riverwood property until a master planning process for the valley can be completed. They have they have cited truly compelling reasons to do so, and I'm going to be intentionally redundant <laughs> and just uh, quickly mention a, a few because I think these are compelling reasons that we really should be paying attention to. The 13.7 million CRA abatement is an unnecessary incentive that should be removed. It's not needed to attract developers and it's regressive. Instead, I think a tax increment finance instrument could be used to fund some of the infrastructural priorities that would enhance the development of Riverwood. As Jody uh, very eloquently mentioned, we're spending billions to upgrade our sewer system to improve the water quality of the Cuyahoga River and Lake Erie and yet we're considering um, a development plan to build 200 homes near a floodplain, which increases, I think, the, the future potential risk for the city of Akron. And we also have uh, the potential of storm water and property runoff, which may jeopardize the water quality of the river and then subsequently Lake Erie. There are a ton of unanswered questions with the uh, Petros development, 
How will the public how will the public access the Riverwood development? Where will uh, the public park? Who will pay for the bridge? Who will pay for the building and main, maintenance of the trail? An inclusive, deliberative master planning process will enable the city to do its due diligence. And I know much has been done already, but in assessing a whole realm of uh, impacts, educational, economic, infrastructural, environmental, health, and cultural. Um, I think these are important. What would Riverwood look like and what would its impact be if it were developed to maximize our area's tourism and recreational potential? I think all of you were sent a link to a video that at least gets us to think about other alternative uses for the development of Riverwood. I say think Portland, think Austin, or even Amish country and peninsula. Will we allow Merriman Valley to be further developed for yet more high density housing and rental communities? Which really- I mean, three minutes. Okay. Please wrap I hope up. the city will hit the pause button and develop a master plan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dallas Allman. I saw you earlier. Yes. Dallas? Hello, can you hear me? There you are, yes we yes, can. Yes, okay, welcome. thank you. I, welcome, ma'am. I'm Dallas Alleman. I live at 303 Timber Ridge in Akron and I'm also the owner manager of the uh, Towpath Tennis Center, which is last year celebrated uh, 50 years of being in the Valley. We are one of the first commercial ventures in the Valley a long time ago when this part of the Valley was Northampton. Uh, my part of this uh, discussion here, and there's been so many uh, good uh, points that have been raised, is really the question of, is this the wise thing to do right now? Every carpenter would think about, I think about measuring twice and cutting once. And I think this is a principle that we need to think about here. And when I was reached out to by Sarah Beviano about whether I was for or against this, I reached back and said that I was for a better valley. I am really uh, concerned about what has happened in the past uh, here at Towpath. Uh, we've had two cities, Akron, and we've had Cuyahoga Falls reach out and annex many, many parts of uh, Northampton. And Northampton has been disassembled. We've heard from the uh, Woodridge School District. But the one thing that has not happened in this area and it's never been really considered uh, from the standpoint of a plan that takes into consideration the uniqueness of the area. John Cyberling had a vision that brought about the park and the park has brought about many people that want to come in the area. And just this, um, uh, in December here, I am completing an investment, a commercial investment here at the uh, tennis center of one and a quarter million dollars building a new clubhouse because we had to move away from the river uh, because of flooding issues. We've had five floods here. I still love the valley. I love the city of Akron, but I am asking that everybody step back and really bring all these partners together. So the developers, the uh, citizens, the greater region into a, uh, a consortium where we can really consider what can be done for a future 50 years from now that we can all be proud of. I love Akron. I love the uh, input that we've had from everybody, but I think the atom of uh, the adage of let's measure twice and cut once is what we should do here because uh, once you put in housing, it's very hard to change it. And I'm not opposed to housing. I'm not opposed to the right thing, but I am very concerned about cutting a board that I really haven't measured to, for a full distance. And I, I wanna thank everybody for their time. And I'm so glad that uh, we have so many people that love this area and have concern for it, both from a development standpoint and from a uh, recreational standpoint and what have you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dallas. Thank you uh, for your time. Um, next, I'd like to ask uh, Gail uh, Misko. Is Gail Misko with us at this time? 
Hello, Gail, Misko. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Very good. We'll come back if uh, if we find uh, that she's on. Uh, next I don't see anyone with uh, that name in the uh, in the waiting room, or in, I'm sorry, in the participants list. Thank you. Uh, my participants list has it on there. Uh, next, I'd like to ask uh, Ben McMillan um, if. Ben McMillan is with us. Ben McMillan. Ben McMillan, no. Hello. Okay, not seeing Ben McMillan. I'm going to ask: Is is there anyone else here that um, wishes to um, testify against the proposed uh, development um, on Akron Peninsula Road? Is there anyone else here wishing to speak against? Mr. Chair, it sounds like um, Jessica, who spoke earlier, has her partner with her that would like to make a comment. Will you allow that? Uh, sure, absolutely. Uh, if you could please provide for the committee uh, your name and address, and I respectfully request three minutes. Uh, um, and and uh, please, please do not be redundant, please. Thank you. You're welcome. Please provide for the hey, My name is uh, Chris Harvey. Um, 1431 Newton Street, Akron, Ohio, 44305. Bigger Heights. Um, I'm an Akron resident, 32. I've uh, been here for 32 years. Um, ba basically, I just really wanted to quickly say as a resident, as a person of color, um, the, the, none of this sounds equitable. It sounds like more of the same. Um, that's, that's just all I wanted to touch on. Uh, a lot of the new developments around the city for people that are black that live in the city, none of these new developments are really equitable for us and none of it is really advertised for us. As a person that goes outside and enjoys the outdoors, I know that black people are underrepresented in um, outdoor recreation. And so it's just more developing for me. I'm just not for it and that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you for your time, sir. Uh, anyone else wishing to speak in, against uh, the proposed development on Akron Peninsula Road? Anyone wishing to speak against? Anyone? Anyone? Very good. Uh, we'll close uh, the public hearing portion uh, of this um, uh, proposed conditional use request. Um, I'm going to ask if there's any comments uh, from uh, uh, Mr. Hardy. Are you on? Um, Mr. James Hardy? Yes, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> yes, Mr. Hardy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, members of the committee, I really appreciate your opportunity um, to, to speak with you. And I know uh, Mr. Segedy, the planning director, might also have some, uh, some words as well. I just wanted to briefly touch on some things that are just factually not true as it relates to some of the comments that were made. So first of all is the tax abatement policy. And I think it's really important for council to not only recognize what was passed several years ago, but to be proud of it. Um, recently, uh, we just learned that um, at, for the first time in over 15 years, Akron's housing values, which have been incredibly depressed as a result of, um, is finally starting to bounce back an 11% increase. That's real wealth for homeowners. And it really doesn't impact renters to the extent that, that um, many might try to say it does. We are seeing for the first time ever a real movement in wealth creation in the city of Akron. We have people who live in the city of Akron that own homes that are worth $9,000. And we are trying to do something about that by getting more investment into the city of Akron. In 2015, before this city council and this mayor came together to try and do something about housing, we had seven residential permits pulled, seven. We now have over 1,200 in some form of development. That is incredible and should be talked about. The other piece, which I know Mr. Segedy can, can brief more uh, in depth for anyone who has any concern, as someone who is a product of the Akron Public Schools, served six years as the Akron Public Schools uh, board member and board president, someone who loves the Akron Public Schools, I can tell you with absolute certainty that the residential tax abatement policy in no way, shape, or form harms school districts. In fact, it helps. Why? Because you can't get 100% of nothing. If there's no development happening in your city, if there's no appreciation in the property values, and yes, I hate the property tax as much as the rest, 
but that's the way our schools are funded right now. They aren't seeing an increase, they're seeing a decrease. And that's why in part we did what we're doing, which is why we have the full support of the Akron Public School Board. We have the full support of the Akron Public School Superintendent and Treasurer to do the things we wanna do. And when we talk about equity, just to remind everybody that Woodridge is the 249th richest school district in the state, in the state of Ohio. You wanna know what Akron Public is? 591st. There's a huge difference in terms of what we're talking about here. The other piece I wanna talk about is investment into the environmental aspects of our region, our river and our community. This city, these residents are pumping $1.2 billion into cleaning up the river. We took that river and we should be proud of it from a river that was on fire to the river of the year by the National EPA this past year. That's us, that's Akron. Our ratepayers are putting that in there. Not half the people on this call, not many of the people who are trying to opine on the better uh, uh, valor of this particular conditional use, we put those dollars in. And we continue to put those dollars in and we're incredibly proud of it. Um, we talked about point source of control and potential runoff from the residential pieces. We have had biologists, both from the developer, but also from the city of Akron who are paid every single day to work on behalf of the residents and the river that we all serve. They've all looked at it not just for the last month, but since last year, have all signed off on it. This is a very thoughtful, methodical approach that we've taken to make sure that it is right for the Valley. It's a balanced project that we have the right partners at the table and we feel very proud about it. The other piece I wanna address is that somehow this development is an example that we don't care or are not investing in our existing neighborhoods. I think anyone who's been involved in the city of Akron over the last five years knows that that is factually untrue. We have been, involved in every single one of our neighborhoods through the Great Streets program, trying to build back our neighborhood business districts, including the Merriman Valley, many of whom couldn't come today because they're so busy trying to save their own businesses. We've been working on housing in every single one of the neighborhoods. For example, every single other large uh, residential project that we brought before this council has been awards three, nine, four. These are areas of real investment where we're trying to, again, build comps, build the ability for these residents to both rehab their homes and gain wealth out of existing homes. This is the first time that we've had a, an investment in Ward 8, and we're incredibly proud about it, but I reject, and I, it's hurtful that the folks that work so hard, many of you are on council, work so hard in your wards with us in OID to improve the business districts, to improve the housing conditions. We are doing just that. And we are, we are very proud of this. So I would just say that, you know, this is a very balanced approach. We are incredibly proud to be supportive of this project. We certainly invite questions and we certainly want to uh, work through this with council over the next coming meetings. But I, I, I just want to say that it, it, I don't want us to get on this bandwagon that somehow the tax abatement policy in particular is unequitable. We are talking about an abatement of the difference in value Mr. Petros and all of the folks that are going to purchase their homes in the Riverwoods are going to pay property taxes. The Woodward School District loses out on nothing. And in fact, at the end of the 15 years, per what they talked about, they will get a windfall of taxes that didn't exist and wouldn't have existed without the things that we're putting together. We want to be a community that offers real options for everyone. And that's exactly what we're doing. There are gonna be times when we bring projects to city council that are focused on renters, that are focused on rehab, that are focused on middle income neighborhoods. And there are gonna be times when we bring things that are focused on higher income. Everybody along the spectrum is included in our housing policies. So you're seeing one piece of it today, but it is not an example of how somehow we are abandoning all of the other parts of the city that we've been working so hard. In fact, we work more day in and day out in those areas, as you know well, than we do anywhere else. So I appreciate your time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hardy. Uh, Mr. Segeti. Thank you, Councilman Fusco, and thanks, James. I just wanted to touch on a couple of things that James mentioned and uh, go in a couple other directions to respond to some of the comments. So uh, as he mentioned, if there's no development here, there is no additional tax revenue from this property. The intent of the tax abatement program is to spur residential development. Suburban communities all around us build new housing on a continual basis, 
yet we in Akron are expected to just sit back and not try to compete. This is an already developed area with existing infrastructure and utilities provided by the city of Akron. This isn't farmland 20 miles away from downtown Akron and Medina County. This is a couple miles from downtown in Akron in, in Ohio's fifth largest city. I've lived in this city for almost five decades, all of them in Ward 4. I've seen this city lose people and jobs and shopping for as long as I've been alive. Real sprawl goes on all around us and creates the very inequality that some of the commentators here have decried. Separate and unequal schools, segregation by race and class, reinforced by restrictive zoning codes, and income inequality. And we hear crickets. Will everyone here show up at the Hudson or the Green or the Medina County Planning Commission the next time an investment there sucks people in jobs out of Akron? Residential development finally happens in Akron, and this is in Akron, I will remind everyone, for the first time in generations after we've lost a third of our population and our residents have been deprived of home equity, jobs, and retail opportunities and seen disinvestment and decline, and people throw out every excuse they can think of to stop it. We wanna welcome people to Akron, all people, regardless of who they are, to all neighborhoods. Mayor Horgan believes in an Akron that is good for existing residents and welcomes new ones. I share that vision and I'm proud to help realize it. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Segeti. Okay, um, I'd like to open it up to any uh, committee members at this time that may have questions and, um, I don't see all committee members on my screen, so I'm gonna need some help, Sarah. Maybe you could see them. Uh, anyone have any questions from the committee? Any committee members? I can see that Councilwoman Samples has her hand raised. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, go ahead, uh, Councilwoman Samples. Thank you. Um, I apologize if you hear my granddaughter. I'm grandma sitting today. Um, this question is from Mr. Petrus. I'm not sure if he's still on the line or not. Um, if, if you could tell me um, how many partners do you have on this project and how many of those partners are environmentally focused on this project? The, the partners, uh, hi, I am here. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Petrus. The partners on this project are uh, the West Creek, who is one of the largest and best conservation groups in the Ohio region. Uh, that's why we went with them. They're very impactive and they have a lot of other easements in the, in the, in the area. So we have West Creek and we have um, uh, also Davy Resources, which is the largest uh, environmental manager of properties in the Northeast Ohio region. Uh, we wouldn't mind some others and we probably will bring others in on that side. Uh, from a financial partner standpoint, it's only ourselves in Pride One, the builders. But within our team, we have some of the top environmental people and conservation people in the area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, just a couple more. I promise you. Yeah, absolutely. You're fine. I promise. Um, so I want to be delicate with my question and statement here because I don't want to offend anyone. But as I listen to the individuals who are against this project, I'm very concerned that none of you all live within a stone's throw of this project. I mean, I, I do see there's probably four or five that actually live in the city of Akron, but I, I'm just concerned that was there any outreach to people who live in the Waterford, people who live in Timbertop. I mean, they're renters, but they still live there. Some of those people have lived there since the day those places were built. So I, I just want to know, were they even considered in this? Because I, that concerns me greatly when we disinclude a certain segment of the community, especially with some of the comments that were made about what kind of people are going to be living here. So that concerns me greatly. Um, and then lastly, um, you, I, I, out of all the people on this call, I've gotten a call from two people and they are, they're environmental people. I know them. This is the work that they've done for a really long time, but this doesn't seem like an environmental conversation going on right now. It seems like we're talking about tax abatements, um, sidewalks, and we're not focusing on the things that really are a concern 
to a certain uh, a group of people and it's called nasty environment. Um, and, and so I'm just trying to figure out what it is that we're really aiming for here. Are we upset about the tax abatements? Okay, baby. Or are we upset about the environment? So I, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm having some concerns in that area. So I don't know if there's something someone wants to add to that. I do appreciate the individuals who actually have reached out to me. Like I said, two people out of all the people who've sent in letters actually called about the environment. And, um, and that concerns me. I would hope that at some point, maybe the developer and those individuals can get together because I have heard a lot about sidewalks needing to be a part of this project um, and maybe talking that through. Um, but to, to get rid of a housing project when this city hasn't seen any in such a long time concerns me if we can all meet at a meeting of the minds. Thank you. Can I, can I respond? Thank you, Ms. Samples. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Petros. I, I would just like you to thank you, Mrs. Samples. And uh, good luck babysitting. Let's have a look, what do you got there? <laughs> Anyhow, um, the we've heard from various apartment tenants in the market now that have read about this in the paper and are familiar with the products that we design and we're trying to implement. And many of them are very, very interested in living here for a very simple reason, COVID. These are individual units where you pull into your own garage, you have your home heating and air conditioning system and you have a patio in the back. And it's a very safe, very comfortable place for a renter to live. And through the design department and through the work that we've done, by the way, for the last six months, our hundreds of hours of meeting and planning with the professionals at Akron, we've been able to design a community that does have sidewalks, by the way, within it, ways to connect to the main trail systems that are without it, but mostly safe, affordable, current needed housing for people that want to get out of buildings where they park in common areas and go through common hallways. This is, we, depriving people of this right now would be very bad. And you're, you're very right. I mean, there is really no reason for this not to happen. This is the wave of the future. If anybody understands real estate, single family listings and leasing is the most popular thing happening across America now. A lot of people choose to be renters. Some people have to be but this provides a good safe environment for them to go. And ma'am, environmentally, if 73% green space and a conservation group isn't the way to do this, I don't know what is. I mean, we should be the poster boy for future development in my opinion, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Petros. Um, any other committee members have any questions? Okay. I don't see any. Um, I have a, a question for Mr. Modic, and, and I think if he's still on the line, I don't know, or if uh, someone from the, um, I apologize, for the um, West Creek or, or Davie, what have you, uh, but my question is basically what is exactly going to be done uh, to protect the river? What steps will be made? Uh, hi, Mr. Fosco. This is Greg Modick. Um, I believe Greg Snowden is still on. I did just receive a text from Mr. Schaefer that he had to uh, drop off here. <clears throat> he had a prior commitment for a meeting that overlapped. Um, so what steps are going to take place here? First, I want to make something very clear. I'm not misleading when I say proposed associated with these improvements out there. It's part of a plan and a process. And to, to further the idea of the partnership that Ms. Samples was talking about, West Creek Conservancy is the first step in many with their partnerships. They build with consistently groups such as Cleveland Metro Parks, Summit Metro Parks, Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, the city's projects are in and that adjoin it, state and federal funding levels as well. So this is the first step in a mechanism. Um, you know, a, a master plan is just that, it's a plan. It's not the funding mechanism. It's not the acquiring of the land. It's not the physical infrastructure of it. So what are we doing? As part of our process here under the current zoning, there's no requirement for land to be donated. As part of our project, we've gone out and acquired additional land at additional cost in order to put it in preservation and conservation. So how are we gonna protect it? We're gonna get it into the ownership of West Creek Conservancy who can partner with other agencies to develop the plan and take the feedback of the community, of the people to understand what there is to do. I had no vision of a bridge. I understand that bridges cost money. 
Akron throughout their planning process and with feedback from West Creek Conservancy, it was to provide for the opportunity for a bridge. So I'm not misleading when I say that there's opportunities for bridges, canoe input outtake. It's the opportunity to gather the feedback from the residents and the communities and all the stakeholders involved and implement what's needed there and go after the funding to do it. Just like if this project weren't to happen, a master plan would have to generate all that funding to do whatever the vision may be. We're creating a mechanism to get the land into the ownership of that property. I want to tell you that you know, I'll hold it up here briefly because I am quite proud of it. Summit Soil and Water issued me the 2019 Urban Conservation Award. For the first time in nearly 20 years, they had given that to a developer. They did that because I'm very, very proactive in working with them to understand project sensitive areas, plan for it accordingly, and then implement that plan and monitor and observe it throughout. We're not putting a plan out saying this is what needs to be built when it comes time for detail engineering. The process is approval and then detail engineering. The city staff that you folks rely on at the council level all day, every day in your environmental groups within Akron, your engineering groups within Akron, and your planning department will review our plans, comment on those plans or approve those plans, and then hold our feet to the fire to ensure that what we do is proper and the right way to do it. And that's done in conjunction with Davy Resource Group, as well as West Creek, City of Akron, and any other partners that may come into play. And the last thing I wanna to touch on that I, I not your question there, Mr. Foscal, but I did take a bit of offense to it. Sort Trail, I never once promised a north-south leg would be remediated. I promised the east-west west leg as part of our development would, and we did do that. The north-south was something that the city of Chicago Falls put into play via TIF that was created by our project, and they are planning to do something on that road. That was their commitment, not mine. I did not lie. Sycamore Golf Course, the land adjacent to Mudbrook and 1,500 feet of Mudbrook is being donated this year, this month, to West Creek Conservancy. The barn is being donated to the city of Cuyahoga Falls. They had potential uses for it for storage and then public use in trails. There's funding mechanisms throughout our community in Sycamore that are funding those. So the fact that they're not seen on the ground here and now that instantly there was a trail and a revitalized barn does not make me a liar. You can check with Cuyahoga Falls to see everything that I just mentioned with regards to Sycamore and Soric Trail. My commitments are true. They do are, they are followed through on, and they will be for this project as well. We will get this land into the ownership of West Creek Conservancy, continue to work with them. Anything that's developed by a master plan, the city of Akron, the residents, and any other partners that come into play to ensure that it's implemented properly to the best we can help do that. Thank you, Mr. Modic. Thank you. Uh, is there any uh, committee members and or council members who have any questions or comments? Mr. Any Chair, I can see that Councilwoman Amobian has her hand raised. Okay, I cannot, but uh, absolutely, Ms. Amobian, you're, we're, you're welcome to comment or question. Sure, and I appreciate that. And this is for Mr. Segedi and, and Mr. Hardy. Um, I know we've been talking about this, this project for a long time, or rebuilding and trying to gain and retain citizens. Could someone give us an update on where we are with these new projects that we have sold or the ones that are currently under construction that may have already been, been um, uh, purchased? If you could tell us, are these new residents or these people that are moving from different places in Akron and if they be. I'm curious about that. Um, and I do have other questions, but I'll say those for tonight. Thank you very much. Sure, yeah. I'm happy to start with that and then I'll invite um, James to jump in if he's got some additional comments. But um, I think one thing that we're very proud of in the city administration is that we, as James had said earlier, we've gotten a very great diversity of housing types and locations. So for example, all you know, we've seen um, new uh, office to residential conversions downtown. We've got single family um, housing projects, either- uh, Jason, excuse me. I'm, I'm sorry, Jason. Sure. If you could, I mean, just due to the lateness of the hour, I, I miss a Movian's questions or point on, spot on, uh, just a little bit deviating from the actual conditional use zoning request. If you could just briefly uh, provide that information for us and then maybe expound a little bit more within an email uh, because it's just, it's kind of just a little bit off uh, task in terms of the conditional use zoning that we're here to discuss. And Under 
Yeah, understood. We, we've seen a lot of new housing development in the city um, in a variety of locations. And uh, a lot of the apartments, about half of the residents have been out from outside of the city and half are existing Akron residents. I think the single family, uh, the proportion might be a little different. I don't have that information at my fingertips. And Ms. Amopi yeah. and I will send you And I appreciate card. that, Mr. Mr. Yeah, I appreciate that, Mr. Fesco. But, you know, I know that a lot of the questions got into this, but I certainly would appreciate it in writing. That's fine with me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Amobian. Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, any other questions or comments from anyone at this time? Reference the conditional use request on Akron Peninsula. I'm not hearing or seeing anyone. So um, I'm going to invite everyone back. at seven o'clock this evening. We will have an additional public hearing. The only difference is gonna be that the committee will make a recommendation to all of council. Again, be it um, in favor, against, or to table the item, to refer the item for consideration at a later committee meeting. So uh, again, everyone's invited back at seven o'clock. Um, I'm gonna ask the committee members and council members to please stick around. Uh, everyone is welcome to stick around, uh, but we have the rest of our agenda we have to address uh, within the planning committee. So thank you all for attending this afternoon. Look forward to seeing you at seven o'clock this evening. We're gonna move on to the balance of the regular agenda at this time. And I am going to uh, request that we take time on two through and including seven and um, ask for a, a, a favorable recommendation with suspension of the rules on item number eight. This is the particular item that we discussed last week um, in reference to the uh, special improvement district. Uh, this was addressed by uh, city council. Uh, look for my notes here. Um, it's a, a special energy district with partners uh, back in December 5th of 2016. That's, uh, that was the creation of the, of the uh, district at that time. Um, and so this in essence is uh, an assessment uh, for improvements that will uh, conserve on energy um, um, within this uh, special energy improvement project district, which includes um, 530 and 540 South Main Street. Um, is there any questions or comments? at this time. Uh, if there's not, I'm going to request a, a, a request for a suspension of the rules with a favorable report. From anyone on the committee. I'll make that motion. Thank you, Mr. Kamer. Is there a second? Second. Thank you all. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it. Uh, Ms. Viviano, can you please uh, conduct a roll call, please? Sure. Fusco? Aye. Kamer? Aye. Baylor? Aye. Samples? Aye. That motion passed four to zero. Thank you, Ms. Viviano. Uh, short of any questions or concerns, we'll go ahead and move in. We'll uh, uh, take time on the balance of the agenda and we'll move into the uh, new list of legislation at this time. Find it. All right, very good. Uh, the item number four, which is an ordinance authorizing the mayor or his designee to accept title and ownership of the real property known as the Heisman Lodge, located at or near 1000 George Washington Boulevard. Um, I see uh, Mr. Beckert is here, uh, I believe, to speak on this one. Mr. Beckert? Yes, thank you, gentlemen, members of the committee. Um, this is a piece of property that is adjacent to the uh, Soapbox Derby. Um, it's the Heisman Lodge, which is also adjacent to the Rubber Bowl. Um, the state of Ohio, through the University of Akron, is going to deed that property at no cost over to the city. The property is approximately three acres. It does abut the Rubber Bowl, and um, the building we are going to be looking to redevelop the building, um, hopefully into something uh, that would be able to, to help the uh, Soapbox Derby and some of the um, uh, adjacent residents in the area. 
Um, and also the property in the area can also be redeveloped to possible housing or some commercial manufacturing. Very good, thank you, Mr. Beckert. Um, I would just contend and I've always contended that um, assuming FAA would check off on the idea, I think the residential pieces would, would, would be uh, very interesting. I, th I think very marketable as well. Uh, the views uh, up on the hill there on George Washington are striking. Um, and you get a real nice view of all of, uh, all of Akron, uh, all the way down to downtown. So um, obviously it's a challenging site due to topography and everything else, but um, it would be very interesting to see that uh, developer come in and do something with that. Um, is there any questions from any committee members at this time? Uh, Mr. Becker's uh, consent agenda okay on this one? That would be fine. Thank you. Is that okay? Yes. Mr. Chair, I can see that Councilwoman Amobian has her hand raised. Oh, good. Uh, Ms. Amobian. Okay. Did someone ask you a question? And he said that the dating is to us. It sounds like they're giving it to us. How much, what is the value of this building and property? The value? And would we have to demolish it? You say we, we repair it or renovate it, but uh, is that what we're going to do? Um, the university has also Could put into the agreement if we if we do need to demolish the building that they will Go ahead, Ms. Becker. No, they, they will contribute to um, some of the cost of the demolishing of the building. Right now we have the, the building appraised at $160,000. Um, the building does need quite a few upgrades like HVAC and plumbing and um, some ADA access issues. Uh, the building does have some strong structural issue um, things that that make it uh, a good possibility for redevelopment. Um, so if we can get the right developer in there to do this, as well as uh, as Mr. Fusco pointed out, the possibility of maybe some residential in the area um, to complement it, I think the site would be uh, it's going to be an asset to the city. Well, let me follow up with this question. With the university having such problems financially, why aren't they selling this themselves? Um, I think they, it's really a, of no use to them at this point in time. And it's, it's not a very easy site for someone to come in and, and to buy this from the university. Um, as you know, they, the rubber bowl ended up uh, in our hands at the end of the day. So we were trying to also redevelop that at this point in time. So I think the university would, would rather just um, give it to a, another public entity for us to try to develop rather than them trying to sell it. Okay. You okay, Ms. Amovi, any, any further questions? Okay, I'm not uh, seeing any, is there any other questions or comments from anyone on council or the committee? Anyone? Okay, how about, uh, I'd like to entertain a motion that we place this item on the consent agenda. So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. All in favor, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Against? The ayes have it. Uh, it's unanimous. Uh, the next item is item number five, which is uh, approving and confirming, this is a resolution, uh, the appointment of Ronald Owen to the City Planning Commission. Is there someone here to speak on this? Thank you, Chairman Pesco. I can speak just very briefly in the interest of time. Um, Mr. Owen is a small business owner in the second ward who has been nominated by Mayor Horrigan to fill a current vacancy on the Planning Commission and his resume was uh, provided to council and I'd be happy to answer any questions as I'm sure would uh, Director Segedi if council has any. 
Thank you. Thank you for that offer. Um, any questions or comments from any uh, committee members at this time? Um, anyone? Not seeing anyone. Uh, no questions or comments from uh, council members? Any questions or comments? Is the consent Mr. agenda Chair. okay? Oh, Mr. Lombardo, did I see your hand up? Yes. Okay. Yes. I would just like to say, uh, Mr. Rano, and he's a good guy, he's involved in the community and he'd be a great addition to the planning commission. Thank you, Mr. Lombardo. Mr. Chair, I can also see that Councilman Malik has his hand raised. Oh, okay, Mr. Malik. Uh, Mr. Lombardo uh, stole my comments. So just echo, <laughs> looking at his resume, you know, clearly, you know, very involved in the community in North, North Akron baseball. So, uh, you, know, you know, and it's not an easy job to be on the planning commission. Uh, so we appreciate the service that he'll provide uh, there uh, for the next few years. Thank you. Uh, any other council members, any questions or comments? Is the consent agenda okay on this particular item? Anyone? Um, it's, it's council's preference, but because there is a current vacancy, I do know that there is an, another meeting coming up in December and um, this person could be seated for that meeting. So um, passage today would also be appreciated if possible. Very good. Uh, I'll make a motion for suspension of the rules. Thank you. Second. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Against? The ayes have it. Very good. We'll report that out favorable with suspension of the rules this evening. Thank you. Uh, short Mr. Of Fesco, any... Mr. Fesco, I'm back. Yes. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. No kidding. problem. <laughs> Can we go back? Sure. You have a question? Yeah, it was, it was about the issue I was raising before I was cut off. Oh, okay. Uh, reference, I'm sorry. I. It's um, the property at the rubber ball. Okay. Sub, sub box. Yes. I was just somehow I was kicked off. Oh, okay. Uh, did uh, what? What question would you like answered? I I don't know. I Miss, Mr. Brent was on answering my questions about the university not being able to purchase sell this themselves, and I want to continue that questioning, please. Okay, okay. Mr. Becker. Hmm. Um, yes. Go ahead. Um, yeah, the university um, would rather try to give it to a local government entity rather than them trying to sell it. I think it's, it's more of a, a longer process for the university to try to get something out of it. Um, they would rather have us, since we are you know, the local entity, try to develop it and try to get something out of it rather than the state going through the state uh, um, processes of trying to get rid of that property. How much did we spend on, on uh, demolishing the rubble bowl? D didn't we participate in that? Yes. Um, to date, we've only demolished about a third of it, which was approximately $200,000. But we also got a state grant um, through ODNR to help us with that. So we, we did, we were able to offset some of that cost with the state grant. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, no problem, Mr. Moby. Uh, anything else to come before the committee? I think we set a record here, ladies and gentlemen. So um, we will adjourn at this time. And uh, Sarah, I'll let you take it away for the next meeting. Thanks everyone. Our next committee of the day will be the Public Safety Committee, and those committee members are Kamer, Samples, Swirsky, Malik, and McKittrick, and all committee members are present except for Swirsky, so we're ready whenever you are, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, we'll go ahead and move forward uh, with calling the Public Safety Meeting to order. Uh, like Sarah said, all members are present except for Councilman Swirsky. Hopefully we can continue our uh, prayers and thoughts uh, with him and his family. Uh, we did hold a meeting last week, and I do have minutes to approve. So can we approve those minutes, please? So moved. Second. All right, thank you. Uh, I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, moving forward, we have two new pieces in front of us today. Uh, our first one is a uh, ordinance authorizing the mayor or his designee to accept a grant from the Fire Prevention 
and safety grant from the Federal Emergency Management Agency authorizing the expenditure of funds for procurement of equipment and provision of services consistent with the grant and declare an emergency. I see we have a few uh, firefighter personnel on, so I believe District Chief uh, Kyle, are you on? Yes, sir. All right, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, committee members. Um, I, ha I do have with me today, uh, Lieutenant Falkenstein. He's the author of this uh, well-written grant. So we owe, owe our gratitude to him for uh, taking the time to write this and uh, uh, making a successful grant. So I'll provide a brief summary of the grant and then of course, open it up for questions. Um, the Akron Fire Department submitted a grant to FEMA to continue the very successful smoke alarm program that our Fire Prevention Bureau manages. With the grant request, uh, we look to improve and expand the program by not just installing smoke alarms, but by also adding carbon monoxide detectors. Um, with the approximate $25,000 that was awarded, um, we're looking to purchase, of course, uh, carbon monoxide detectors. And also some of the money will be spent for some printing costs for pamphlets uh, with each installation as we've done with the smoke alarms. We also provide uh, home safety uh, inspections and uh, uh, home safety education, uh, and especially looking at the fire safety education. Um, so with that, um, that's a brief summary. Uh, again, I have Lieutenant Falkenstein, the author with me. So if there are any other questions, we'd be happy to answer those. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate that. I do see we have Councilman Malik. His hand is raised. Go ahead, Councilman, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, District Chief Kaut. Um, I, I think that this is a great program and really in that preventative measures and community engagement. Um, just uh, one, one main question, I know this is about $25,000. This isn't the whole piece of funding for the whole program, right? This is just the specific grant that's going to be applied to it. Well, this this is what was uh, funded for uh, this the uh, for this grant. That is uh, what we asked for, so that's what we get in this year. But uh, um, I'll let uh, Lieutenant Falkenstein expand on that uh, question if he has if he has something to add. Yes, thank you, Chief. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, good. Um, so uh, first off, I just wanna say thank you for allowing me to participate and uh, thank you guys for everything you guys do. Uh, but this uh, $25,000 will be spent, like Chief said, uh, on carbon monoxide detectors, which uh, by our numbers, uh, just with smoke alarm installs uh, will be enough for two years worth um, of smoke, oh, I'm sorry, carbon monoxide detectors. Uh, we also have secured roughly $10,000 in extra funding to keep this moving forward. And so we're hoping with the uh, advertisement, um, the publicity and everything that this gains that we're gonna be, it'll help us in moving forward to getting funds uh, to keep this moving uh, in, the, in the future. I think that's thank you, Lieutenant. Thank you, District Chief. Thank you, Councilman. Any other questions from uh, committee members? Looking at the uh, hands raised function first. I don't see anybody. Any other council members? If so, yeah, let's Chair, go. I can see that Councilwoman Omovian has her hand raised. Yes, I see that. Thank you. Councilman Omovian. Yes. I'm curious as so how do you determine which homes you go into? Or these are installed in residences, aren't they? That is correct. Uh, this will be open. See, the, the nice thing with this is this is going to make the Akron Fire Department stand out amongst fire departments in the state of Ohio and in the United States because we will be the only fire department that has a program for carbon monoxide detector installs that is open to every resident. Right now, there's a few out there. There's a handful out there, but they have stipulations. We do not have stipulations. The only stipulation is you have to be a resident. I mean, how will you determine where you go? I mean, there are certain areas of the city where they have a lot of fires and and they have a lot of problems with this, this will be um, carbon monoxide. 
This will be uh, based off of the request uh, by the residents. Uh, they will call the Fire Prevention Bureau and or email the Bureau. We'll take their information and it's the same, same setup as we have with our current smoke alarm program. And we'll go out and install those uh, carbon dioxide detectors. Now we have focused in the grant, there are a few zip codes, a few areas of our city that have a little higher rate of CO calls, carbon monoxide calls. And uh, we are gonna try to focus on those areas, but this is, okay. open. This is open to every resident. So do you keep track of this in some kind of fashion about different wards and different places where you've installed these smoke detectors and these carbon monoxide uh, detectors? We do. I'm just curious. As to, I realize there are some people that are more proactive than others, and I just want to make sure that we're not overlooking because people are just not well educated and aware of how to go about making themselves known to the city that they want these resources. Right. Is there a way for us to see right. where they have been installed? And that's that's where it's our job to focus on getting that information out, especially in those focused target areas, uh, in those uh, zip codes that I've uh, uh, brought up as far as in the grant and through research. Can, can we have that information? Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councilwoman. Any other questions or comments? All right, I don't see anybody on the hands raise function. Uh, Chief, what's your pleasure on this? Well, if we could suspend the rules so we could move forward with, uh, with fulfilling this grant, that'd be great. All right, thank you. Can I get a motion to suspend the rules, please? A motion to suspend the rules with favorable report. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any anybody opposed? All right. Well, thanks, guys, for joining us and keep up the good work and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Moving on to our next piece is a resolution uh, presented by Councilman Neal calling upon the FOP Union Lodge 7, Akron Firefighters Association Local 330. Collectively, the unions, Akron City Council, the administration of the Akron Municipal Court, and the administration of the City Council to engage in discussions leading to racial equity training to promote governing in a more equitable manner, thereby promoting the growth and success of the city and declaring emergency. And Councilman Neal, I'll turn it over to you since you're the sponsor of this resolution. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of Council. Um, as has been outlined in the part of the resolution that uh, Councilman Kamer read, hopefully you've all had a chance to read the resolution. Um, uh, when we as a city uh, engage in dialogue about racial equity, um, it is important for us to have a normalized standard understanding of what that means. Um, we all learned through reimagining public safety when we were engaged with our police department. Um, our eyes were opened on um, just different levels of understanding. And in that discussion, um, many of us spoke. Uh, I know I shared that when we talk about reimagining public safety, it's really a talking about uh, reimagining how we govern, period. And if you listen to the last uh, public hearing during uh, the planning session, there was much discussion about inequitable practice um, and how policies inequitably impact segments of our community. And, and basically because we pass legislation uh, all the time without a, the proper understanding of uh, what we mean when we use these terms of uh, racial equity, inequitable impact, uh, equality, which is, which is different. It's just important that not only those of us on council have the same understanding, but that we have the same understanding with the administration, our unions, and uh, uh, all three branches of city government. So um, this is so that we can begin a discussion of 
finding a, not, not just a, a, a training that council takes separate from the administration, separate from the unions, but so that we all have the same understanding that we seek to uh, find common ground in our training and understanding. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there uh, for now, uh, Mr. Chairman, in case there's any questions. Thank you, Councilman. I do got a couple of questions. I'll go ahead and start with myself. Uh, I do know the resolution states two unions. I believe the city of Akron has four unions. Can I ask a question why we're not including all four? Um, I focused on the, um, the, the safety forces unions since they have the most direct impact. Um, the others, I, I, uh, depending on the, the administration's choice, uh, maybe uh, that training would be shared throughout the rest of the city, but mainly because of those two that have uh, the most direct impact with our uh, citizens at probably some of the most sensitive and stressful points of time. All right. Uh, my other question is I do see under the third whereas clause, I'm not sure if all my committee members has the uh, resolution in front of them, but I kind of want you to explain that a little bit. I know it says notwithstanding the excellent service of many police officers, members of council, members of the city administration. Sure. Okay, go ahead. Sure, it says, uh, you know, it's acknowledging that in all departments, you know, uh, folks are doing a good job, but structural and institutional racism exists because of the inherent practices. Um, I mean, shoot, uh, just to be clear, we have five uh, black members on council. I would think we would be very sensitive to our communities on passing policy that would uh, inequitably impact them, but we do. The very fact that, uh, you know, we, we passed um, uh, the uh, water bill, we knew that it was gonna adversely impact uh, mm -hmm large portions of residents from our community because it was based on a median income. If you extract a certain segment of our community and just focused on you know, uh, uh, the black community, that median income is much lower. Um, you know, there's been policies passed on how uh, that, that come from us, it comes from our school board on how schools are built. All you have to do is drive through our city and look at how some of the schools are built. Adversely impact our community. So, I mean, and that's not intentionally, but when mm -hmm. you're not aware of the historical practices, um, you think that's just the way things are. Uh, so um, that's talking about, and we've had much conversation about this. We, that's talking about structural and institutional practices where the outcomes, you know, create, create the uh, inequalities and inequities in our, in our communities. Gotcha. Well, my final question before I ask if there's any other questions, I know there, I think it's the fifth whereas clause. Uh, I think this whole resolution more focuses on the police than the fire, but the fifth whereas clause, uh, I believe it really comes out and strictly focuses on the uh, FOP and law enforcement officers and doesn't really mention the uh, fire department. Okay. Um... I'll, if you don't mind, I'll read it, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. It says, whereas the community and the community organizations devoted to racial equity, law enforcement, the Fraternal Order of Police and other police organizations and government must work in partnership and achieve lasting structural change. Yeah, it, 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 it highlights that. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Uh, committee members, uh, I'm looking at the hands raised function first. Uh, as of right now, I don't see anybody. I do see uh, Councilman McKittrick. Go ahead, please. I, I guess what I'm not understanding here is where I hear uh, my colleague, uh, Councilman Neal, talk about policy. Um, I'm not exactly sure how uh, the collective bargaining units institute policy. Um, I, could you enlighten us to how they would do that? Uh, well, they have uh, I'm going based off of my conversation with Mr. Cozart, Mr. McKittrick, as well as my conversation with you. 
when unions had concern about the policy that was brought in to hold unions responsible for um, uh, legal, uh, the one about the unions and holding them responsible for some of the economic impact uh, uh, that cities have to endure because of lawsuits that come come upon them. Um, you know, in our discussions uh, and in my discussion with Mr. Kozart, uh, you know, the unions wanted to have input on something that would impact them. Uh, uh, also, uh, in my conversation with Mr. Kozart, he kind of asked me why did not I bring something in in regards to dealing with racial equity training. And I shared with him at that time, I would not ask the unions to do something that we on council and administration had not done yet. So this is to uh, address my conversations with, with uh, Mr. Kozar, who was the uh, president of FOP, as well as just the, uh, in, in conversations with, with others, uh, there was the fact that uh, we hear about uh, uh, the police department, but the fire department engages, and we've talked about some of the, um, not intentional, but just understanding different cultures uh, that needs to take place when you're servicing a community that you're not familiar with. So um, I hope that answers your question. Councilman. I, I, I really think that policy isn't set by the bargaining units. I think I, my experience over the years at policy is generally uh, set by the departments and the administration. Uh, I'm sure that they could have a, a comment on it, uh, their opinion, but I, I don't know that the uh, bargaining units would have any part of making uh, um, the actual policy itself. Well, well Mr. McKittrick, if I, if I may, one of the concerns, not just from discussions that I've had with folks within our city, but if you hear across conversations across the country, is folks like us, legislators, enacting policy that impacts segments, you know, like our unions without their input. So this, this gives um, those who need the training. And I'm sure within, and, and I know this because uh, uh, serving on the um, uh, uh, Race Equity Committee with Ohio Municipal League and the um, everyone from uh, the regional vice president of, I mean, the regional president of Noble, which is the National Association of Black Law Enforcement Officers, um, police chiefs from different communities all of them have talked about how they feel they've been talked to, legislated to, rather than being a part of the change. This right here engages those who are, who need to have the training, and, and within their within their, uh, I'm sure there's some best practice for law enforcement, some best practice for fire regarding race equity. I'm sure there's some discussion. If you mention, if you notice, it always men also mentions our ju uh, judicial branch. All of us that uh, serve our community need to have the same level of understanding of what it, what we mean when we talk about uh, uh, racial equity and how to engage citizens and enact our policies in an equitable manner. Engage citizens in a, in a, in a, in a proper manner. Anything else, Councilman? Uh, no, that's that's all. Thank you. All right, thank you. I do see uh, Councilwoman Samples has her ra her hand raised. Oh, thank you. Um, um, I I do support this resolution, Russ, but I think you should add all city employees. I don't know if that's you add, adding ask me or whatever, but I don't think we should just limit it to us, the administration, police, and fire, because, I mean, it doesn't stop there just because it's in those departments. I think it's some kind of training um, and engagement that uh, all people who are working um, in these positions need to undergo. And so that's the only thing I would like for you to probably change is to add city employees 
because I think it's important that we all, I don't think this is about changing policy. This is about us engaging and having a discussion about these issues that clearly do exist. Thanks. Thank you, Councilwoman. Go ahead, Councilman. No, I, I was just gonna say thank you. I mean, you know how the legislative process works. Um, uh, the power is in the collective, the 13 members. So nothing comes in perfect. So I, I, I uh, welcome any opportunity to strengthen this uh, resolution. I'm not asking for it to be passed today because one of the things I learned in listening was that, you know, again, I want the, the unions to be able to have input on this resolution um, uh, so that we can hear, hear from them. Um, so I, I appreciate the, the comments that, I, that I've received from all members of council thus far. Thank you, councilman. Let's see, any other uh, council members on the committee? I don't see any. Uh, other council members that are present. I mean, you looking at the hands raised function first. Uh, all right, I don't see nobody. Um, Russ, another comment I have that just came up in my head a few minutes ago is, uh, you know, as a body that votes on uh, the union uh, with the labor relations and the administration negotiating and having those conversations, I mean, should we really be involved uh, with those conversations? Oh, most definitely. I mean, we just had a whole segment on reimagining public safety where we engaged in some of those conversations. This right here is about Again, we, we, we mentioned that the, the areas where uh, those who are uh, serve this city engage uh, our constituents at the most sensitive and urgent times, you know, when we talk about police and fire. Um, I hear and I agree that all employees should take, should undergo this. Uh, it, it would be my hope that if we engage the administration that the uh, human resource personnel department would then make that even more uh, a part of uh, employee training. Uh, I'm sure there's some, some part that's there right now, but, but what's more important, the part is that it's critical that we all have the same level of understanding. When you, when you, when you talk to people and one of the uh, uh, go to a lot of conferences and I can point to Miss Samples and Miss Amobia because we, we've sat in a lot of these classes. The first thing you have to do is come to a common understanding um, of what this means because even with good intentions, you can enact policies and think that you're uh, uh, not injuring a segment of your constituency group and you're doing just that because we're, we're not aware. So I hope gotcha. that answers, Mr. Chairman. Okay. No, thank you, Councilman. I do see I do see two other council members. Their hands are raised, but obviously Annie McFadden uh, had her hand raised too. So I'll call upon her first, unless she wants to yield to the other council members. Go ahead, Annie. I'm happy to yield. I do just want to say, uh, you know, we can definitely, at least from the, you know, administration and the 1800 city employees, we can definitely give council a short update on all we're doing for uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion training. So I'm happy to do that, but I'll yield if council members have questions and then I can do that at the end. And I know uh, we have representatives from HR and then I believe um, Lieutenant Horney from APD as well, if people have specific questions about what we're doing. All right, thank you. I appreciate that. All right, I'll go with uh, the next hand that was raised was President Somerville. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And I think um, Annie kind of hit the nail on the head for me. My real question is, can we get an understanding of what training is already being provided across the board uh, for all of these unions? That would be really helpful to know what's already in place. What are they doing before we ask them to do something? Uh, something more, maybe it might be something that might be repetitive or overlap. I'm not sure. So if we can get that information, that'd be helpful. Okay, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Councilman Malik. I the, the same, had the same point as President Somerville. Uh, I think it would be helpful to hear th that update from Ms. McFadden. And uh, also I know that some of these issues were discussed in the uh, personnel and culture, reimagining public safety working group uh, and so I'm, you know, I know that 
Lieutenant Pointing was involved in that as well. So, uh, and I know that there are ongoing efforts. So, I uh, would certainly like to to hear more about that because you know I, I don't think we need to. We obviously need to have that understanding. Yeah. Thanks, Councilman. Uh, I'll go back to Annie. Did you want to uh, speak again? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, and um, I'll start off with the um, the kind of the, the city as a whole. And um, I'm sure um, Ms. Meyer Snipes from HR and then Lieutenant Forney can, can hop in um, specific to um, other policies or APD policies specifically. Um, you know, I think as most people know, um, Mayor has been really focused on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts ever since the beginning when he got into office. Um, the momentum really started to pick up after we officially were able to create an HR department in 16. As you all know, that was kind of the first hurdle. Um, we did hire the uh, the first time diversity training officer and Ms. Myra Snipes, who's on this call, and I think we've really made um, some, some great momentum since then. Um, the biggest update that I think will be pertinent to this conversation um, is that we already have a program called a NeoGov, and it's essentially our, our hiring and, and onboarding and performance management software that we already have. We've actually added another component to it recently called um, NeoGov Learn. Um, that's now in our tool belt. So it really acts as a training and kind of continuing education model um, for all city employees. So um, that's cultural diversity training in there, um, you know, can be in person whenever it's safe and then is now available online as well. And we can offer it citywide. Um, and then I know APD has some specific training policies in place as well. Um, but uh, really starting next year, we just rolled out NeoGovLearn um, just about a month ago, maybe not even. Um, but next year we'll be able to start mandatory um, basic courses for all city employees um, in, in items like uh, unconscious bias and implicit bias, um, and that we can do it across the board for all employees. Um, there's a myriad of um, uh, uh, diversity and inclusion offerings that can be included in that, and there's about 30 to 35 different um, programs that we can um, build out. And so HR is in the process of going through and kind of um, uh, mandating some of those initial courses so that all of our city employees, not just public safety, um, has continuous diversity, equity, and inclusion training. Um, in addition, um, we're, we're really trying to roll out um, uh, more work in, in, in the IDI, in the intercultural development in inventory um, for more managers, for more public safety officials, for more HR officials, uh, the mayor's office staff and all of the cabinet took the IDI in 2019. So we all have very specific individual work plans um, that came out of the IDI. So that's something that we've already been working on as well. And again, we're trying to institute it um, to some managers managers. Ideally, you know, we, we'd implement it all the way down, but there's a cost associated with that. So we're, we're taking the first steps to do that. Um, uh, we're also in the final stages of hiring our um, first supplier diversity officer um, that's going to be working with our MCAT program and, and our Akron Urban League to really kind of um, uh, diversify what we do on a procurement basis. As you know, that procurement report came out earlier this year. Um, so that new position is, I think, really going to help us in terms of that position is going to be meeting with departments, um, interfacing with a lot of different city employees in this new position. And we're going to be kind of creating that consistent and open dialogue um, around diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts and how we integrate those in our processes and procedures. Um, and uh, one of the last things I will say is that we also joined um, GARE, which is um, kind of a national network for, for government entities to really elevate racial equity. So I think that's something that's been really important for us. Um, our membership does include kind of assistance with the development um, on a kind of a racial equity strategic plan. Um, and it kind of helps us with operational plans and it kind of gives us a tool in routine decision-making to kind of to, to work equity into everything we do. Um, they also have monthly meetings. So a lot of us have been sitting in on those so we can kind of engage with other municipalities and really talk about um, equity issues in our, uh, in our communities and kind of problem solve together and learn best practices. Um, we did put a lot of this out in a uh, press release that we did um, towards the beginning of the fall, I do believe. And so a lot of it is on um, the, the website as well, but we'll try to continue update that so we can kind of keep the community informed and we have something to point to when we kind of continue to evolve these efforts. Um, so I don't know if um, Ms. Snipes and then after that, probably Lieutenant Forney, if they have anything that they want to add um, specifically to add on to that. All right, thanks. I'd love to hear from both of them, please. 
Uh, this is my, this is Myra Snice, a diversity training manager for the city of Akron. As Annie stated, all of those initiatives, I'm looking forward in working with our administration um, so that we can put the plan of action she stated, specifically our learning management system, um, preparing virtually, but uh, when things change to do some follow-up classroom uh, training. So. Uh, as far as meeting with other trainers within the individual departments, such as police and fire, we were working as a team to share with them. I even have people currently reviewing some of those courses so that we can jointly agree on what would be the best courses to implement citywide. Thanks. Uh, we'll hear from uh, Forney and then we'll see if there's any questions. Hi, my name is Jerry Forney, and I'm the Lieutenant uh, Cor the Training Coordinator for the Police Department. Um, that's what my current assignment is. And we're just finishing up uh, 16 hours of mandatory uh, in-service training that included uh, a four-hour block on bias-free policing and our use of force updates. So that's what we just finished up. And what we're doing now is we are getting ready to, um, we're in the planning stages logistically, of uh, our 2021 training. Um, the administration has came to uh, my office and said that they wanted a, a 40 hours of in-service training, mandatory training, that including that is to include some of the things that you guys are talking or we're talking about here, along with the uh, basic police academy. So we put some things together uh, that, uh, some documents together and given them to the uh, administration um, to, um, you know, basically get their permission to move forward with it. But, um, you know, like I'm saying, like I said, that's a 40 hour um, in service that'll have uh, some of the subjects that we're talking about uh, in that training. Does anybody have any specific questions that I can uh, try to answer for? Anybody have any questions for one of those three? Mm. No. No. Mr. Chair, I do uh, take Councilman Malik. Councilman Malik. Go ahead, Councilman. Yeah, L Lieutenant Forney, uh, and thank you all, uh, all three of you for, for those comments, because I think that was really helpful. Uh, Lieutenant Forney, I was wondering if you could just talk maybe a little bit about, um, you know, how, uh, I, I know from watching some of those reimagining meetings that, you know, OPADA really hasn't required training requirements for the last few years, and you know, you guys have in some ways kind of been left on your own with regard to some of the in-service. Uh, and I appreciate that that it's being done, but can you kind of talk about some of those efforts? Because I, I did appreciate that you guys, uh, you know, are working on that. Well, uh, really to develop uh, the in-service um, topics, you know, we get, uh, we look and uh, ask what the need is. Uh, you know, also within the department, you know, what uh, other units are seeing as an issue. Uh, they're looking at uh, statistics, uh, you know, just like this last year, we did some, uh, some remedial driving or traditional driving. We were seeing that um, some of our, um, that we were getting in accidents and in those accidents, it was uh, a lot to do with backing. So I'm just saying that's where that information came from. And we incorporated that into our uh, last year's uh, 2020 in-service <coughs> driving. Uh, this year going forward, you know, we're looking for things that are, you know, are relevant and uh, training and um, and what you're talking about in inclusion, inclusion, uh, those kind of things that, that you know, it's certainly uh, things that we need to continue to work on. So that is going to be uh, part of our, um, our 2021 uh, training. Thank you very much, sir. Is that okay? Councilman Neal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to again say I, I appreciate what's shared, but hopefully everyone under understood. Hopefully, it gave some everyone an insight on why this resolution is important. Each department has their own training, separate from each other. We on council are still seeking training. So that means there's different conversations and different levels of understanding on on again what we mean when we talk about equ equity. Um, is when we talk about institutional and structural racism and, and, and disparity, it's 
critical for those of us that set policy to have an understanding. Then it's, uh, when you get into the unbiased and, and whatnot, that, that, all of us need that, but that's even more critical for those who, who execute the policies that we put in place. But the point I'm, I want us to understand is, is that it's critical for us to have a common understanding of what we talk about so that we know not just how the policies that we implement impact our constituents, but how do they impact our employees? How do, they, how do policies that we set when we pass uh, a, a policy that impacts law enforcement, be it no chokehold or whatever, how does that impact them? Are they, are, they, are they a part of the process? When we talk about addressing structural and institutional practices that create um, uh, outcomes that, adver that are adverse to our intentions, it's usually because there's a glitch in the system on, on, on what we do. So this is about creating synergy within the city. Um, so, and, and to uh, Ms. McFadden's point, uh, council, if you go back and look at some of the notes that go back to when we first learned about uh, the uh, Brookings Institute, Elevate Acro Report. If you go back and look at those notes, you receive uh, the uh, Greater Alliance of Racial Equity Report. Because at the same time, I gave it to the administration. Mm -hmm. Ms. Uh, Amobian and Ms. Samples, who participated in the race equity training from NLC, would be aware of that as well, because it was from there, not saying that the administration may not have had that information already, but that it was forwarded to them. So we've, we've had that information. The, the challenge is that the administration has gone through training. We should have gone through that together. That's part of the institutional dysfunction that takes place. And it's just, why wouldn't we go through the same training together? Not intentional. It's a practice that was put in place between most of, between before most of us were, were even in any of our positions. But the reality of it is that's the way business has been handled over the years, which creates the outcomes that we have. So this, Please understand this resolution is about us walking together, coming to understand the, the training that's taking place in the different departments so that we can strengthen it. And especially for those of us that are on council, we do not need to, yes, we need training, but we need to have an understanding of the training that's taking place in every department so that one, we can understand and better interpret when the policy comes from, uh, be it the uh, uh, the administration mm -hmm. or if we're, if it's something that's coming from the human resource department um, this is about us creating synergy that's, uh, there's just really no other way for me to, to say it uh, it, it uh, one of the issues all intentions are good but when different departments are getting different levels of training having different understanding it still creates uh, uh, I'll say a, a communication gap. All right, gotcha. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Councilman Malik, back to you. Yeah, I just wanted to, I think, try to, I, I think my understanding of you know, what we just heard, especially from Ms. Snipes, was that there is a common, uh, uh, you know, training program across the city. Certainly firefighters are trained differently with regard to in-service and police are trained differently mm -hmm. with regard to in-service. But in terms of what training is av available, whether it's through NeoGov or through Stark State or what have you, that is citywide and there is a plan. Um, I. I think that this discussion is helpful insofar as it actually raises a lot of, you know, good ideas for things that as we as a council can do, whether it's participating in the IDI process, or maybe there's room for council to, you know, be a part of the, the intergovernmental process that Ms. McFadden 
uh, mentioned and being involved with some of those conversations. And, and I think that, you know, to me, that that starts with us and figuring out what uh, advances we want to make as a 13 member body. Uh, because, but I, you know, in some ways, I do think this is misdirected insofar as, you know, it's calling on people to start something that is already in progress instead of meeting those folks where they are. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, if I may answer that. Go ahead, Councilman. Um, no, it doesn't exist. <laughs> because we're, if this existed, what you would have is, is a steering committee with representatives from, uh, representative from council, administration, unions, and the, uh, the uh, judicial system. And if we really were functioning as a city, even uh, the um, school board is voting on their race equity policy and plan this evening. We would have a holistic and then even engaged since we're a city and we really wanna understand racial equity and the impacts of the policies and practices that we put in place, we'd even reach and, and partner with the chamber. So this does not exist. And, and, and if you've never taken or gone through equity training, and, and, and I just have to say this, I was co-vice chair for the Race Equity and Leadership Council for the National League of Cities. That council put in place best practices for government leaders across the country. One of the first things we tried to do was get people to understand the importance of normalizing the conversation. Normalizing the conversation means you don't have one level of understanding amongst council, another in, in the administration, another in the police department, the fire department, and no common understanding. So I have to disagree, this doesn't exist. What this is asking us to do is to have a conversation about having a common understanding of conversation about how not only the policies that we uh, put in place, but how to execute it if they meet our end goal and is the actual outcome equitable. And so, um, uh, you know, uh, hopefully, um, you know, just to the point, even about uh, the, the program that the administration has through the Human Resource Department with Mrs. Snipes, how many of us on council have taken it? And then have we had a discussion as, as council members to where we understand what's meant when we talk about racial equity? We have it. So this is about creating, uh, uh, again, on, on council, we could only act through ordinances or resolutions. This is our way of communicating that we need to truly function as a collective body, to have a collective understanding of how uh, we are moving forward as a city when we have this discussion about uh, uh, racial equity. And so uh, this resolution is, is to uh, initiate that conversation not just in different departments, but collectively. And hopefully we would form a steering committee that would help us all move in the same direction with the same level of understanding. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. I do see, uh, hold on, before I go to Councilwoman Samples, uh, I do have another question uh, that just popped into my head. The administration, I'm reading the resolution, says the administration of the Akron Municipal Court uh, are any of those part of the unions collectively bargain or are they not? Can anybody answer that question for me? This is Montrella, if I can speak or the- Yes, yeah, sure. Or, Jackson, go ahead. Topic, but uh, so no, the courts, we do not have um, any collective bargaining unit members. We, all, right. all at will employees. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Okay. Um, Councilman Sam or Councilwoman Samples, I apologize. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, when I read the resolution, I, I didn't look at it as if it was um, just taken to be negatively. I don't think uh, Councilman Neal was 
saying what wasn't being done in other departments. What he's saying is collectively, we need to address some things that are going on. Um, I don't see anything wrong with addressing things that we all see that are going on. Um, if someone is doing training in their respective departments, that's fine, that's great. Um, and if all these things are being done, I think these kind of things should be set on the table, especially when we're working on reimagining Akron. Maybe some of these things that we're already meeting about are already being done. So now we're meeting about things that are already being done, but why are we meeting about them if they're already being done? So I, I think we're getting offended because of him making a suggestion as to what we should be doing as a collective group. Um, we've tried this on council when we had some issues on council and we brought someone in who tried to work through some things with us and it started off good, then it ended up with just three, two, wait baby, three or two people wanting to show up. And so, you know, I, I appreciate what you're doing, what you're trying to do, and I think it's much needed. I just don't want us to look at it as if he's trying to tell people yeah. how to govern in their departments, but us to collectively have an understanding that we have an issue that we should be talking about and addressing because you can't fix it if you don't talk about it. We'll just keep talking about it and saying we're doing something about it and nothing will ever get done. So, you know, I sort of kind of feel like there's some angst, like he's trying to tell you what to do in your departments, and I don't think that's what's intended here. Thank you, Councilman. Um, I look at this resolution like I would have made a phone call or inquired by an email first. Uh, that's how I think. I'm pretty sure I do probably a lot of my business with the city as an elected official, uh, at least for almost, well, I'll be going on my 10th year next year. Um, it seems like a lot of times, Councilman Neal, you bring in resolutions uh, where it could have started with a phone call or an email. Uh, I see HR, uh, the administration's here, the police department. We actually don't even have somebody from the fire department here, but, uh, oh, I don't think so from the last meeting, but uh, yeah, that's my opinion. I don't think it needed to come to a resolution. Uh, obviously we just, uh, Annie explained it pretty good along with others. Um, so I look at this as a, a resolution that's not needed, but go ahead, Councilman. Uh, I see McKittrick, his hand was up too. Go ahead, Councilman. We'll try to end this. Well, I just, wanted, I just to wanted to say real quick, I, uh, Obviously, everybody's aware I worked 33 years for the city of Akron. Um, I was in numerous classes with Myra Snipes, great classes. And these were classes that were offered to all of the city. Correct me if I'm wrong, but these were classes that everybody throughout the city. So everybody was on the same page. I don't think anybody's offended that they you know, feel that they're trying to trample on what the other departments do individually. But I think collectively, uh, if they're still doing the same thing as when I worked, um, they, they did have everybody, everybody on the same page. And then each department took what was more applicable to the, their department and had their own training in addition to that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Neal. Yeah, Mr. Kamer, yeah, I just wanna address some of your comments first. Um, and, we, and, and you all can pull them. We can ask here to pull them. This information, the report that Ms. McFadden mentioned has been sent to members of council over the last four years, at least three, four different times. You, you, at, you say it, it takes a phone call. Ms. McFadden would know. When we've heard about the Elevate Akron report, first let me back up. If council remembers, when we passed the National Day of Racial Healing resolution, it was said at that time that this isn't a resolution that we just put on the shelf. This is something we have to work to. This was before we heard about the Elevate Akron and the Brookings Disparity Report. At each time, I would share information with this council and with the administration because I served on the race equity and leadership council for National League of Cities. When the Brookings Institute report came out, I pulled that information and Ms. McFadden would remember and Ms. Nish, I shared that report with them. And I said, the challenge is us addressing this issue collectively. 
since that report has come out, council and administration has not had one caucus about the most damning report to come out of, on this city, which is the uh, uh, Elevate Akron report about the disparities, the disproportionate disparities that have suppressed the black and brown community of Akron. So Mr. Kamer, I have been in conversation for over the last four years regarding this matter. I have sent emails to council, emails and videos to council over the last three or four years. And um, in regards to, uh, and I thank Ms. Samples, Councilwoman Samples for sharing this. I'm not, I'm not criticizing what's being done. What I'm saying is we cannot operate in silos. We cannot function in silos. And part of that is because of a, 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 a institutional practice that has made uh, uh, part of the way we function as a city dysfunctional. I'm saying, as it states in the resolution, it acknowledges the good work that's taking place, but it says that the importance of us engaging in discussion, collective discussion, for a collective understanding so that we could better serve our community. Having an understanding on how we execute our budgets, as I said, during the planning department, they spoke about the disparable impact of, of potential of passing that uh, uh, plan, which kind of baffles me. We say we want a plan, but yet we're gonna pass something beforehand that it impacts uh, residents of Ward 8 and, and, and Cauga Falls. All of this, when you have an understanding of uh, uh, equity and how structural and institutional practices adversely can impact folks, it makes us better legislators, makes administrators better administrators, and makes all of our departments more sensitive and more empathetic and more insightful when engaging our, our constituents. So uh, again, this is, this is uh, as uh, Miss Councilwoman Sample so uh, insightfully stated, this is not criticizing. This is just acknowledging that we need to work together collectively to have a common understanding. Because look, of all the stuff that's been shared, council has not been exposed to any of it. Collectively, we have not been exposed to any of it. Yet we pass policy legislation every week that can potentially have an adverse impact on some of our constituents and residents of our city. And we heard a very lengthy discussion about that earlier this afternoon. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Annie, if you don't mind, I would like to say thank you for attending and uh, can you keep council members informed moving forward uh, with anything that we need to know? Yeah, absolutely. And as I said, we put out um, a big press report, uh, you know, in the fall about it. And then we're just rolling out our training. So really, it's 2021 um, that we're going to really start to implement it citywide. And then um, Miss Snipes here is also um, an IDI trained facilitator at this point. So now that we're going to start, um, you know, going to um, to other groups of people beyond cabinet that we did, you know, this year, I'm sure um, she'd be happy to engage with council in that discussion if you guys allocate budget appropriately. All right, thank you. Councilman sure. Neal, what would you want done with this? Um, well, I, the resolution speaks for itself, sir. Um, I, what I'd like to see is for us to pass the resolution, but not today, because I want to make sure that the unions actually have a chance to hear from it. But I also want to speak to something that Ms. McFadden said that I want us to understand as council, because she said IDI, okay? And some call it DIE or DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Please understand that this right here also speaks to something is, you could talk about diversity, you could talk about equity, you could talk about inclusion and never talk about structural and institutional racism. The report that came out from the Brookings Institute talked about structural and institutional racism. I want us to be clear, that's what this resolution, one of the things that this resolution is talking about. We have to understand that and how it impacts everything that we do. So 
uh, what I would like is to give, uh, like I said, I've had a conversation with uh, president of FOP, Clay Cozart, uh, about a month or so back. Because uh, he asked why didn't I bring something like this in, and I shared earlier why. Because I wouldn't ask the unions to do something that we, as council and the administration, has have not done. Um, so I'd like to for uh, both unions. I'd like for the court system to be able to look at it and have their input, and then we can vote on it uh, when we return. All right. Well, uh, Councilman Neal would like time on this. I'll make that uh, motion. We have a motion for time. So, Do I have a second? So, so, so. I don't so we don't have a motion. We have a motion, but not a second for time. Uh, I'll make a motion for an adverse report. Second. We have a second. All in favor of adverse report. Aye. Uh, Aye. No. Can we do can we do a roll call, Sarah? Kamer? Aye. Samples? No. Malik? Aye. McKittrick. Aye. The motion for an adverse report passes three to one. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Uh council members, committee members, thank you for uh joining us. And with that, nothing else come before us. We're adjourned. Adjourned. Thank you. Thanks everyone for your patience today. I know we're a little behind our usual schedule. Our last committee meeting of the day is the budget and finance committee meeting. Those committee members are Freeman, Amobian, Malik, Baylor, and Lombardo. I did get a message from Councilman Freeman that he had to step away. It doesn't look like he has come back. Um, Councilwoman Amobian, are you available to chair budget and finance? I am back. Never mind. Thanks. Hey. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, all right, like to uh, call to uh, call to order the budget and finance committee meeting. If we could please uh, have a roll call. Freeman. Aye. Mobian. You can see that she's here, but I'm not seeing her on the screen. Councilwoman Amobian, can you hear me? Malik? Aye. Baylor? Aye. And Lombardo? Aye. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we have minutes from our last meeting. I'm looking for a motion to approve the minutes. So move. Second. A motion to second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, very good. We have nothing on the old agenda. Uh, item number one has been pulled. So that takes us to item number two. This is an ordinance ratifying the actions of the administration of the Akron Municipal Court in contracting on an emergency basis with Cardinal Maintenance and Service Company Incorporated for custodial services for daytime sanitizing and high usage in public areas of the Akron Municipal Court, authorizing payment therefore and declaring an emergency. So fine, how are you? Uh, Councilman Neal, you might want to mute, I believe. I just press mute for him. Okay. Uh, do we have anybody that's going to be speaking for us today on this? Yes. Good afternoon. It's Montrella Jackson, Court Administrator, Akron Municipal Court. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Um, so the proposal you have before you is uh, earlier this um, winter, you all approved the uh, new uh, contract in place for custodial sanitizing. Uh, this portion of the work that was done was from June to October uh, that we um, instituted on an emergency basis as we reopened the court in June due to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So this would be for the sanitizing uh, during the daytime that took place for those months. Okay, very good. Questions or comments from committee members to begin with? Other council members? Montreal, what would be your pleasure on this? Is this something we would want to place past tonight? I believe so. I was working with Purchase to make sure we get all the invoices current. Okay, then. Uh, so, wouldn't someone entertain a motion to suspend the rules? So moved. 
Second. A motion and a second. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Thank you. All right. We'll see that that uh, is passed out this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. And then we have one last piece. It's an ordinance approving and authorizing the expenditure of $1,000 from the budget of Akron City Council for the purchase of training provided by the Government Finance Officers Association to members of council and other staff in declaring an emergency. And our sponsor is, I believe, Mr. Neal. Mr. Neal? Okay. Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Okay, that's fine. Uh, was, uh, there we go. You're you're on the other resolution. I mean, yes. Uh, yeah, legislation. Yeah, we're, okay. We're on the uh, we're on the final piece in budget and finance. Okay. Thank you, uh, Miss Holly. Before you guys, I gotta. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Sorry about that. That's fine. Uh, uh, question about the the legislation. Uh, yes, we just read it in. Okay. Well, yeah. Uh, we've had a uh, discussion. Um, uh, in regards to uh, the budget, and there was uh, by members of council saying that you know we need to have a plan, we need to have an understanding. Um, this resolution is for us to get just that. Um, uh, the uh, I apologize, I don't have it in front of me, but the government of, of uh, uh, office of financial administration is the same office that trains. Uh, that the city is a member of. Uh, Mr. Fricker and his de uh, department have a membership to this organization. They provide them with best, best training practices. I reached out to them and asked them if they had anything for uh, council so that we could understand, have an understanding of budgets. Um, uh, uh, and uh, they presented uh, this proposal to us. Um, so the training we would get would be a synergy with our uh, uh, finance department to give us uh, best government practices is critical uh, that we understand uh, how to look at and properly interpret the city's budget. I mean, uh, 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 not only our city's budget, but when we understand how to look at budgets period, we'll be able to look at uh, budget requests that come from us or requests to finance uh, uh, levies for uh, other agencies or counties, uh, we'll be able to look at it. It won't just look like numbers to us. We'll be able to better interpret what those numbers mean. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, at a, if, if the supporting documentation was attached to it, you'll see that it's usually $85 per person uh, for 13 members on council. They're providing us that training for only $500. Um, and it will be the type of training so that we can have an understanding of best practice, best government practices uh, for uh, legislative bodies to be able to understand and uh, uh, implement um, best budget practices. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions or comments from uh, committee members? We'll begin there. Right. I don't see anybody. Any comments from any other council members? I'm looking. Uh, Councilman Malik, I see you've unmuted yourself. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, and thank you, Mr. Neal. Um, you know, I, we've had previous discussions about the budget, and I do think that some kind of training would be helpful. So I, I don't know whether this is that, but it certainly looks like it would be helpful. Um, the question that I had was, um, I think you, the, the attachment shows $500, but the ordinance shows $1,000. What, what explains that? That's correct. Well, uh, that's so that this being the end of the year, uh, Councilman Malik, if uh, we chose to add more members to that, um, because uh, most of us during the um, public demonstrations and whatnot, there were uh, citizens, citizens groups that asked to be engaged in the budget process. Um, per our charter, part of the budget process is citizen engagement. If this body chose to add more members, it was to make sure if there was an additional cost, the money was there because um, we, we, as a legislative body, we could uh, adjust 
and come back and reappropriate, but it's just to make it um, easier. Since this is our last meeting of the year, uh, to have that money already allocated. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Mr. Chair, I'm not sure if you can see all the hands raised. Um, I cannot. Councilman Lombardo. Has <laughs> yes, Mr. Lombardo. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking at the, uh, I guess what the attachment was with mostly like the syllabus. And to me, it just looks like, you know, basic, basic training on, on you know, what are budgets. And I don't know, I just think that we, everybody has an understanding of what a budget is and the, to spend the thousand dollars on that. I know it might not seem much, but it's a lot to me. Uh, I just don't think that's needed for a basic understanding of, of you know, what, what the budgeting process involves. Uh, if, Thank you. If I may, Mr. Chairman. Let me come back to Mr. Fusco, uh, go to Mr. Fusco. So we'll take everyone in turn and then we can come back. Mr. Fusco. Thank you, Chairman um, Freeman. No, the um, <clears throat> we spend, um, uh, I don't know how many hours, five, six hours on the capital budget. Uh, and then we spend, Mr. Freeman, you probably know better than I, but uh, 15, 20 hours on the operating budget. And we basically, in essence, go line by line. Um, and it's ex explained in terms of, uh, you know, the various departments that are most um, affected by this budget are the ones that basically explain the budget in detail to us every year. Then at that point, council passes uh, the overall budgets, uh, both operating and capital. Um, and then after that, we get a second view of each line item. Whenever the legislation comes in for the actual expenditure itself, um, and I think, and I, I don't want to answer for everybody on council, but I, I think, I, I hope everybody has a full understanding of this budget whenever we go to vote on it. I know I do, and I, I don't want to speak for my colleagues, but a full understanding of what we're dealing with and what we're doing here. Um, that coupled with an, another fact that, um, you know, we don't really necessarily need legislation. I, and I don't recall, I know just recently uh, the charter was changed in terms of the minimum amount of uh, that uh, requires legislation. I don't. I mean, offering training to anyone who wants any training whatsoever is is, is absolutely. I understand that, and um, you know that's a good thing for anyone that would like it. But um, at this level, I'm not sure if, if we're need, in need of basic training. Uh, the other pieces, though, that I probably don't even need legislation. Probably just offer it. Uh, work within the system w within the. Uh, budget and finance department and with city council budget and just, uh, you know, see if it can be offered. I, I don't understand a need for the legislation itself. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Fusco. And before I come back, Mr. Neal, looking for any raised hands or you might need to speak up. I'm Mr. Chair, I can see that President Somerville has her hand raised. Hi, President Somerville, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, just kind of wanted to um, thank Councilman Neal first for uh, bringing this forth. I totally do understand uh, the intent. I do believe that, you know, education and training is important. Uh, but looking at the syllabus, it is very basic. It is like the basic 101 on budgeting. Um, and I think at this point in level, uh, pretty much most council members uh, should have already this basic understanding. Um, so I think that, you know, maybe it is the fact that we look at something um, that is a little bit more advanced, or if we deal with council members who have particular questions or want to take advantage of uh, some basic training, I just thought the, uh, the syllabus was extremely uh, one-on-one. And I do believe that most council members, of course, I know, have a basic understanding of public budgets. So that's just my input. Yeah, I was, and I kind of go back to Mr. Fusco. I don't, I'm not sure that... Uh, ordinance was needed for this because of the amount of the request. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, may I answer that? Yes. Okay. Again, as council, as a collective body, we do things by either resolution or ordinance. Um, uh, so that's, that's why this is brought in. And we're asking, since we don't have a budget, a line item budget outline for training, 
and education. We have travel, but we don't have one for education. That's why it was brought in in the, in the ordinance. And you know, I'm concerned when we say that everybody has a basic understanding of how to understand municipal budgets. How many people have taken a class regarding municipal budgets? I've taken at least at least three, if not four. And I can tell you, I'm, every time I go, I learn something. If we understood budgets, would our city have had to sell cell towers because we didn't have the foresight to see that our, our, a city who, who is required, a municipality that is required to balance this budget every year had a shortfall and we had to sell an asset that brought in a half a million dollars a year to balance our budget. Does anyone know how we're making up that half a million dollars a year shortfall? We, the only way we increased our reserve fund was through the sale of those cell towers. It's, beyond, it's, it's our responsibility. Does anyone know how we're going to, our, our reserve fund is underfunded. Since we understand budgets, how are we going to bring our reserve fund up to where it should be? Where are those, where are those dollars going to come from? Since everyone understands a municipal budget. Any my, other comments or my, questions? My, my colleagues, uh, this, this is serious business. This, we are entrusted as, as stewards over the city's asset. And we can't even put together a projection to bring our reserve fund up to where it should be. We have never had a discussion as a collective body on council about how to redress that shortfall. I mean, let's not gaslight our constituents and act like we know what we're doing. Thank you, Mr. Neal. Are there any, I'm looking around. Do I see, am I missing anyone, Sarah? I'm looking too. Thanks for your patience, everyone. I don't see any hands raised. Oh, I'm sorry. I do see now um, Councilwoman Baylor and then Councilwoman Malik. Okay, very good. Okay. Yes, Councilwoman Baylor. I don't see where this is applicable and what you're talking about. I don't see the uh, correlation between uh, what you're saying and what you're um, asking. So, you know, basic budgets, I think that, you know, for the most part, even if a person hasn't formally gone to a training program, they can access it easily enough to understand the basics. And I think that if there was uh, some other type program, uh, it, it should be like uh, the president council uh, president said it should be uh, more advanced or something that's applicable to the budgets uh, that we deal with even with uh, councilman Fusco what he is saying the different budgets there are certain budgets that are really uh, like a, a pretty routine that we deal with as a council that I've learned and uh, you know, those budgets that are the budgets that probably need to be focused on if there's questions. And I'm thinking that you could probably go to the finance committee and get those questions answered or somebody help help out in that area. I don't see where there's a limitation in asking for help when there's a, a department that can help any of us if we have questions about any parts of the budget. And like, was said, we went over it and you did mention different things at that time, but certainly there is help if you want it. And I, I believe that they could answer your questions and help you through the process if you have those those type questions. Ms. Bader, I'm not sure if I understand your point. You were talking about shortfalls and all that. You were going some other direction other than what you had proposed like for no, this no budget training. No, 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 Councilwoman, I'm, I'm not going a different direction. The thing is, 
we are a collective body. We have to have an under, just like when we talked about racial equity training, we have to understand uh, what it is we're looking at, understanding the budget. I mean, do you understand what council's goals and objectives were during a COVID year? Hi, Mike. Yes. Do, do you understand what, what uh, we understand our budget? Yes. Do you know what, what we had listed as our goal and objective? Mr. Freeman, you're in. Ms. Baylor, do you understand? I'm sorry. Do you understand what, what we as council had listed as our goals and objectives under our budget? Now, here's a council where during the midst of a COVID crisis, our budget, do you understand what we had listed since we understood how to use budgets? The only thing we had listed for council under the budget was to buy new chairs. And council didn't even come together to make that decision. That's not understanding the budget. That's not exercising the budget on behalf of our constituents. When we understand the budget, it even gets to the point of what Mr. Malik uh, highlighted, which we've spoken about many times. The, the, the impact of uh, the policy that we passed with the water bill and people not being able to pay their water bill. When we go deep into our budget, we understand that the city writes off about one and a half million dollars every year, turns it over to the county. The county returns about $800,000 every year. But we don't see that because it goes into the general fund. We need to understand that. How can we leverage that on behalf of our constituents? All of that goes into the budget. And I'm sorry, as one of now one of the senior members on council who has taken at least three or four budgetary classes, who runs a, a business and has sat on several boards. I'm sorry, you just don't. Um, organically walk onto city council and understand how to uh, interpret a municipal budget. And even if one person does, again, we are a collective body. There has to be uh, uh, an understanding amongst all of us because it takes 13 to understand how to increase the city's reserve fund. Because unless we have some more cell towers to sell, if we get into another predicament like we did before, we won't be able to balance our budget. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Mr. Yeah. Fusco? Yes, thank you, Mike. Uh, Councilman Freeman. The, um, the budget was prepared uh, before COVID last year. So that didn't necessarily probably reflect what we've been going through, I don't believe. Um, and we have been attacked by the state government uh, and have experienced reduced income from the federal side as well. Um, and so budgeting and, 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 and trying to figure this out, um, you know, we, we have not gone in the red, we've had balanced budgets. Our Budget and Finance Department continuously wins awards for reporting purposes. Um, I, I just, again, like I said, we, we have a threshold. If we want to get some training, we should be able to just ask for it and just get it. I, we don't need legislation. We really don't. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I can also see that Councilman Malik and President Somerville have their hand raised. Okay, Councilman Malik. I'll defer to count, uh, President Somerville. President Somerville. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Again, I just kind of wanted to state, um, I think education and training is important. And if this body collectively wants to uh, do a collective training uh, as it relates to budgets, we can do that. I'm just saying that first off, I don't think that this particular training piece is beneficial to council at this point. Um, it is very basic. It is one-on-one. Um, I am more than happy to work with Councilman Neal um, and others on this council, if they choose, to look for training that's more appropriate, um, that can be more beneficial uh, to all council members. Um, and that's the only thing I wanted to state. Okay, we'll come back to you, Mr. Malley. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And yeah, I just, you know, want to 
take a second. I think this is our last committee meeting of our of the of the year, and um, you know, honestly, like just speaking from a point of like frustration, because you know, I, I agree, with President Somerville and Neil, for that matter, that we we do need more training. Um, I think we need more capacity around how we deal with the budget. You know, this may be just my opinion, but I think that, you know, we ought to be making, you know, more substantive amendments to the budget. We ought to be, you know, engaging in more of a substantive process with the administration about how we engage with the budget. You know, we're approving on the consent agenda, you know, this, this grant that's going to allocate new uh, 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 positions in the police department, but we're not really participating in that discussion of, of how those roles are going to be allocated. So there are plenty of ways in which we can step up and we should step up. And frankly, I've been frustrated with my role and the council's role. Uh, but at the same point, deeply, deeply frustrated to hear one member continually tell the other 12 members, you know, what they ought to be doing. Uh, and, and, you know, in, in ways in which, you know, frankly, we all are trying to involve in, in work towards a spirit of collective work, right? And it, it does not come from one person telling 12 other people what they're doing wrong so really quite frequently. And so, you know, I try to say all of that in a respectful way that just reflects my feelings, again, on this last meeting of this, of, of this year. And, you know, I agree that we should find some kind of training. I think we should have another retreat where we talk about reimagining public safety, where we talk about budgeting, where we talk about some of these more difficult things and get more into the weeds. Maybe we should do that every month next year. I don't know. But, you know, we cannot continue in this, in this way, you know. So that's my, those are my two cents. Thank you, Mr. Malik. Councilman Lombardo has his hand raised. Yes, Councilman Lombardo. Thank you. Uh, well said, uh, Councilman Malik, and uh, along with uh, Councilman Baylor and Somerville and Councilman Fusco. Um, I just, no one can ever have enough training and no one can ever, you know, uh, continually, you know, say that they, oh, we've understood everything. So there's always different twists that uh, budgets take. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, a annual budget, but then maybe after a few months that go along, there's a reforecasted budget. So there's going to be some changes. And, you know, like Councilman Malik said, you know, yeah, maybe we should be getting more into the weeds, but, you know, having heard everything here, I mean, I'm, I'm going to just recommend a, a motion for an adverse report here. Thank you. Okay, there's been a motion made. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second for an adverse report. Mr. Chair, I can see that Councilman Malik has his hand raised. Yes, Councilman Malik. Mr. Chair, I, I just want to say that, you know, perhaps there there is a way in which we could take time and we could see if there's a better, you know, form of training that we could identify working together in a way that you know, we can all support. I'm not saying that I would support this as it currently is, but maybe there is a way that we can find something that we would all support. Maybe not, but that's that's just maybe there's taking time would be a possibility. Okay, well, at, at currently we, we have a motion for adverse report and a second. So we would need to handle that and see how the committee feels on that. And then we could, if that does not pack, go through, we could, uh, entertain time. So there's nothing else. Uh, we have a motion and a second for an adverse report. And all those in favor of the adverse report, please let it be known by saying aye. 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 Any opposed to the adverse report? Nay. Nay. Okay. Ask for a roll call, please. Freeman. Aye. Mobian. Nay. Malik? Nay. Baylor? Aye. Lombardo? Aye. The motion for an adverse report passes three to two. Okay, so the motion passes three to two for an adverse report. We have nothing else to come before us and that we will adjourn. Thank you.
This is our final committee meeting of the day. Thank you.